gamble. Good evening. I would like to call to order the October 1st Lake Washington School Board meeting. To begin, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the October 1st agenda. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty that we approve the agenda. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. Aye. Anyone aye. opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Okay, so for tonight, we have the recognition of our national semifinalists and commended scholars. Dr. Steven. This is a fun evening when we get to recognize our students, and we are thrilled to have you here at the board meeting with your families, and we just wanna take this opportunity to recognize some really impressive work, and we know that when students are achieving at high levels, there's a lot that goes into that. It is um, a lot of commitment and good use of time. It is a lot of support by parents and families, and it's a lot of hard work and late nights and tough studying. And so we certainly wanna commend you tonight and tell you um, how very proud we are of you and your accomplishments. So tonight we are recognizing the national semifinalists and commended scholars from Redmond High School. And I will ask Lindsay Shilati, uh, Redmond High School Associate Principal to step forward and um, take us the next steps. And I just saw Lindsay Friday night at the Redmond High football game. It was, it was a big event, homecoming evening. So it was a fun, fun night. Well, I'm excited to be here and to help introduce some of our wonderful students from Redmond High School. Um, the National Merit Scholar Program is um, students are recognized by their score from the PSAT. And so last fall, these students took the PSAT, and nationwide there's about 1.6 million students that take this test. And our commended scholars are the top 50,000, or the top 3% of those in the nation who take this test. And the National Merit semifinalists are the top 1% of all of those 1.6 million students who took the test last year. So. Our students um, do really, really well, and your students here tonight have done exceptionally well. So students, come on up. I'm gonna have you stand um, around the rostrum here, and then we'll introduce all of you. I hope to study computer science at UW. I like composing music and making video games. Uh, sorry, so there's a little bit of a tradition around this that may not have been communicated to you guys. We like to know what you want to study and where you want to go, but the last thing we want to know is give us a 30 second to one minute, what teacher do you remember impacting your experience here in Lake Washington? And it can be first grade or AP physics, anywhere in between, even kindergarten. Looking for my teachers here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but definitely my AP Lang teacher and my AP physics teacher as well. Those are very interesting classes and I learned a lot from them about the subject as well as life in general. Um, I'm Haley Knox, I'm a senior. I hope to go to the University of Virginia and study chemistry there. Um, and the teacher that's most impacted me has probably been Bob Miller, the AP chemistry teacher. Not only because like that's what I want to study, but because he helped me like grow like inside and outside of the classroom. Hello everyone, I'm Matthew He. I hope to study mechanical engineering or computer science at MIT, which is my top choice school. And an activity I've most been involved in has been Boy Scouts. I'm part of Troop 751 based in Sammamish, Washington. And uh, finally, the teachers that have most impacted me have been my AP Physics teacher, Mr. Gehring, last year, and also my US History teacher, Ms. Costello. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Saha Skoli. I hope to study finance at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, teachers that have most impacted me would be last year's Costello, who's a history teacher, and Gehring, who teaches physics. 
Um, hello, I'm Shua Sia. Uh, I hope to study CS at Stanford. And the teacher that has most impacted me is uh, my fit AP physics teacher, Mr. Gehring. He's taught me a lot about physics and uh, studying in general. Uh, hello, I'm Shivane. Um, and I would like to study computer science at UW. Uh, the teacher that's most impacted me is probably Mr. Osborne, the AP computer science teacher. I've done a lot with uh, Mr. Osborne. He's helped me on a lot of projects. And, uh, well, half of what I've done probably wouldn't be able, wouldn't have happened without him. Um, I'm Selena Edelman, um, and I hope to study poli sci at UW. Um, and the teachers that have most impacted me are Mr. Nodoboom, uh, who taught Honors World and helped me start uh, the club that I run, and Mr. Joffrey, who taught AP Lang. Hi, I'm Katrina Sanko. Um, I'm hoping to study chemistry, specifically forensics um, at UW. And uh, one of my teachers who's been really important to me is um, Ms. Benton, who sort of introduced me to forensics as an entire like topic and really kind of grew my passion for that. I'm Philip Ovenessian. Um, I'd like to study UW, uh, CS at any three UW campuses. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to betray RHS here because I I've only been there for ninth grade. I'm a Running Start student, so my favorite professor is a fellow named Ricardo Chavez at Bellevue College. He's the only reason I passed calculus with my sanity. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Peter Fitch. I'm looking into Whitman College, and I'd like, I haven't decided what to major in, but uh, I'd like to do something in science, maybe chemistry or biology. And uh, the teacher that's most impacted me is Mr. Nodeboom, because uh, he just makes class really interesting and fun, and uh, he really cares about his students. Hi, I'm Mikkel Fulting. Uh, I hope to study some kind of engineering in California or here at UW. Um, I, a teacher that's impacted me is Mr. Villeneuve, the AP United States history teacher. Um, <laughs> despite his uh, once in a while funny comments, um, <laughs> he's a great teacher, and I learned a lot in that class. And um, yeah, he's been a good influence on me. Uh, my name is Ryan Takahashi. Um, I'm looking to study computer engineering at Boston University. And uh, the teacher that has impacted me the most would I be supposed to be um, Mr. Mo, the AP chem teacher, because he taught like, in a very easy to understand and interesting way, which helped you get through the complex material. Uh, I'm Thomas Sigel, and I would like to study history at Villanova University. And the teacher that has impacted me the most would have to be Dennis Villeneuve, my AP United States history teacher, because he he knew a lot about his uh, a lot about the subject, and his class was just a really great opportunity to, to discuss something that I'm really passionate about. So, let's give congratulations to all of these students. And if we have parents in the room or guardians of our students, would you also please stand and be recognized? We want to thank you as well. Don't be shy. Thank you for coming. And students, I would like to just challenge you to make sure that you are including other students and in talking about all of the different opportunities that you have taken advantage of as you've traveled along your academic route and that you would share some of your study tips and look for ways to encourage other students to take um, rigorous courses and to excel in their academics. So very good job. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. That was fabulous to see our students and their success. And so we'd like to now move on to the host school. Um, so Dr. Staven, will you be so kind to in introduce our host school this evening? I will, and I, we'd like to ask our students to gather out in the um, lobby 
and Shannon will be out there to take a quick picture of you. And then, yeah, and then you can go home and do homework, <laughs> Director Carlson said, good, good plan. All right, our host school tonight is McAuliffe Elementary, Krista McAuliffe Elementary. And before we ask uh, Principal Brady to come up and do a presentation, we have just a brief video that we go to introduce our school tonight. Krista McAuliffe Elementary and finding out about some of the wonderful things that makes this school unique. Joining me this morning is Kelly Flagel. And Kelly, what grade do you teach? I teach third grade here at McAuliffe. Behind us is a board that apparently captures kind of the theme of the year. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and what kids are doing? Yeah, absolutely. So the book is called Manji Moves a Mountain. This book is based on a true story about a man named Manji who, you know, it's the village that he lived on on one side of a mountain didn't have access to a lot of resources that were on the opposite side. So he tunneled through, through years of toil, to create a tunnel that would, you know, kind of unite the two towns and bring those resources to both groups. Mm -hmm. So this book has lent itself to two themes for us. Um, one, overcoming obstacles, because we each have our own mountains that we can overcome. and to also just how can you help other people? How can you make a positive difference? Today we're going to do one that Lorenzo asked. We're gonna learn how to say good morning in Russian. Can you tell us what star tickets are? Um, so how do you earn a star ticket? Um, you be respectful. Oh, respectful would be one thing. What else might help somebody um, get a star ticket? How about in Be the kind. lunchroom? It being kind. And being quiet. Bavia gets a star ticket. She puts the back side in her class bucket. The yellow one. The yellow one, even though this one isn't her class bucket, let's pretend. Yeah. I'll give it back to you. <laughs> and then, once a month, Mr. Howden has a star drawing in the lunchroom, which is an amazingly fun time. There's tables full of prizes, and he picks five kids from each class. They get a little certificate and they get to go up and pick a prize. I'm getting to know all of the different names of our schools in our district. I'm trying to really make sure that I know and understand who the person is behind that name. And of course, I remember Krista McAuliffe because it's kind of one of those moments in time that we never forget about. What's your memory of where you were when the Challenger exploded? Yeah, I, I remember I was in third grade at the time and um, in Mrs. Falding's class and we were watching uh, the Challenger take off. It was a big deal because Krista McAuliffe was a teacher and um, we were all excited and our teacher and, our and the whole school was excited and then, you know, the accident happened and, um, you know, the TV was turned off. Right, so a lot of you looked at the pictures first. Chris McAuliffe, as I understand it, loved teaching and she loved kids and she had a passion for education and life and so that's what we want to bring to McAuliffe. What that entails here at our school is a partnership with our parents and our teachers and our students and we're all in it together and we want to make this an inviting and fun place for kids to come each day to learn. Now look at what I put in front of you right here. We are able to have our special ed students, our learning center students in class as much as possible. Um, that is appropriate and as much a part of our classroom community as they can be. How does it feel to be in fifth grade this year? Awesomeness. I heard that you went to camp with the kids in your class this year. Is that true? Yep. Do, what, do you remember the name of the camp? Camp Seymour. Was it a fun way to be with your whole class before school started? Mm-hmm. Are you going to have a super great school year? Yep. And then I will probably see you again next year in middle school. Right. Middle school? I know. It's Inglewood, be, Inglewood, baby. Baby. That's going to be your middle school. <laughs> um, we have really great volunteer base and um, as far as support, it's amazing and um, 
just the enthusiasm and the backing of our parents. Last year, we purchased um, two new TV cons consoles that uh -huh. do run announcements and things that are going on at the school. Um, but in addition, we did math tiles. Two years ago, we replaced some large playground equipment out on the play field and purchased a gaga pit for the kids, which is a blast. What is fun about ASB in your school? That we get to donate school supplies to sister school. So where are your sister schools located? Uganda. 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 Have you ever been to Uganda? No. Would you like to go to Uganda someday? Yeah. So we have about 75 kids who help us out, third, fourth, and fifth graders. And they meet once a month. We talk about cool ways to be kind and leaders at our school. And then we do really cool fundraisers. We do spirit days, right? We get to dress up like crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just a neat way. And sister schools has trickled in the last couple of years, but we're always looking to help our community. And um, now we've been able to help people globally, which is pretty amazing. We'd like to invite Principal Brady Howden to come up and give us a little more information and he has brought his colleagues with him who he will introduce as he gives us more specifics about achievement and instruction. There we go. Good evening. Uh, that was the first time I've seen that video. That was a lot of fun. Um, and it's exciting to be here tonight because uh, we're just so proud of our school and our students and our staff. And so thank you for giving us this opportunity. Um, so my name is Brady Howden and I'm the principal at Krista McAuliffe Elementary. And with me this evening is Bridget Ballard, associate principal, Jim Kendall, a fourth grade teacher, and Karen Hurd, a second grade teacher. We're excited to be here tonight to share with you some of the great things that are going on at Krista McAuliffe to help raise student achievement. The mission of Krista McAuliffe Elementary is that all students are empowered both socially and academically to achieve personal success. Every decision that is made at McAuliffe is based upon the mantra, what's best for kids. This is our compass and guide and helps to ensure that the mission is supported by our staff. Krista McAuliffe Elementary is part of the Eastlake Learning Community. We're a diverse community with many unique programs that support student achievement. We have 545 students who are supported through programs such as General Education, Full-Time Quest, Pull-Out Quest, Learning Center, and Elementary Orchestra. The student demographics at McAuliffe has changed in recent years, as is displayed in the slide shown. McAuliffe is a healthy school with students who achieve high marks in the classroom. This is a result of a strong partnership between our teachers, students, and families. Parent volunteers support students in the classroom and on field trips, lead evening PTSA events, and help assist teachers in a variety of ways. One example of how parents support students in the classroom is through their, art, their involvement in art instruction through the PTSA Art Start program. Some of the art displayed on the walls tonight is a result of our parents' collaboration with teachers and support in this area. Our partnership with parents is crucial to our students' success. Our staff has worked incredibly hard to provide a welcoming, engaging, and fun learning environment for our students. We want our students to love coming to school each day and for our parents to be proud of the school at which their children attend. We believe that by creating a positive school environment, we are opening the doors to students achieving their best academically. There are a variety of ways our students are involved in school. This includes participating in the associated student body, choir, patrol, outdoor education, the school play, school assemblies, and much, much more. Specifically, our ASB team, which is led by teachers Jesse McGraw and Taylor Hill, has provided our students with leadership opportunities that have had a positive impact on our school, community, and world. At the school level, ASB students organize spirit days, deliver encouraging announcements, and volunteer in a variety of other ways. At the community level, our ASB partnered last year with our PTSA to create and promote a Kindness Day, which was embraced by schools across Washington State. 
At the world level, our ASB work with sister schools to provide supplies and resources for children in Uganda. In terms of student achievement, our students have shown high profi proficiency in the classroom in grades K to 5 as measured by state assessments. Although scores in state assessments the past years have been high, we are consistently examining, examining data and addre to address growth opportunities. The data on the slide presented shows McAuliffe's SBA math scores from 2015 to 2018 for grades three to five. You'll find that our students are performing well in this area. However, if you look at the data a bit closer, you'll see that our fourth grade math scores gradually declined from 88.7% of students meeting or exceeding the standard in 2015 to 82.8% of students meeting or exceeding standard in 2017. Our fourth grade teachers responded to this data trend by implementing, implementing targeted instruction and designing student interventions. As a result of their efforts, our fourth grade math scores increased to 92.4% of students meeting or exceeding proficiency in 2018. Similar, similar data monitoring and instructional practices take place across all grade levels to ensure high academic achievement and growth. I would now like to invite Jim Kendall, fourth grade teacher, to talk about some of the specific instructional practices and interventions that his team implemented last year that led to improved math scores in fourth grade. One example of the intentional work we did to address our math scores included creating a schedule that provided teachers with common blocks of instructional and planning time. The teachers highlighted in yellow on your current slide all teach fourth grade. Their specialist in planning time takes place during the same one hour block every day of the week. This has opened the door for teachers to provide flexible instructional and intervention groups with targeted IA and para educator support to better meet the individual needs of our students. These efforts helped us provide focused math instruction for our students, which led to an increase in student achievement in math in 2018 as evidenced on the prior slide. Our change in scheduling was the result of collaborative work between McAuliffe staff and administration for the purpose of supporting professional communities of collaboration and that PCC work by increasing student academic achievement. Teachers and students at all grade levels experience a similar specialist and planning schedule. Not only do we teach within flexible instructional groups, we also carefully look at data to identify growth areas to help inform our instruction. This process includes looking at our previous results from state assessments, identifying areas of opportunity, and prioritizing instruction to increase performance in a focus area. Once a standard is targeted, we develop lessons and formative assessments and use parent and IA support to address this area. The slide presented is an example of how teachers across our school use data to plan their instruction. The data represented uh, shows math results by target level for last year's third grade students. Our fourth grade team is using this data now to design targeted instruction for the class of 2027 in the area of understand properties of multiplication and the relationship between multiplication and division. This area, per the data provided, shows as a yellow circle uh, which indicates there are growth opportunities. Analyzing and responding to data at this level of detail is one of the reasons our school has high levels of student achievement. Our SBA ELA scores the past year, four years in grades three through five have also shown similar high consistency, with 85% to 93% of our students meeting or exceeding standard in this area. As you can see on this slide, there is an overall upward trend in third and fourth grades. That being said, fifth grade has recently shown a downward trend in this area. As a result, fifth grade teachers will be working as a team this year to implement new strategies to address this trend. Our primary students in grades K to two have also done well on state assessments with between 83% to 100% of students meeting or exceeding standard as measured by the Dibbles assessment. One thing our teachers noticed as part of their data analysis work was that our kindergarten Dibble scores were trending down. At the same time, our ELL population, particularly in kindergarten, has grown. As a result, our kindergarten teachers worked in collaboration with our ELL teacher to provide interventions and support to students in the area of language acquisition. The result of this intentional work is evident in our first grade Dibble scores, which show growth from kindergarten as students have gained the skills needed to be successful in this area. 
Another reason we have high achievement in the classroom is because our teachers look at the needs of each student individually. I would now like to invite Karen Hurd, one of our second grade teachers, to explain how we monitor and support the individual needs of students. Last year, we created a data grid to support students who were not at standard and to identify barriers to students reaching their full potential. The slide presented shows an example of the data grid that our teachers use to better meet the individual needs of their students through focus instruction, personal connection, and collaboration with families. We've found that each student has their own story that needs to be heard and understood. The data grid is a tool that encourages teachers to look at students through multi multiple lenses and subgroups for the purpose of supporting them both academically and personally. As you saw earlier, our students have performed consistently high on state assessments. Our work with the data grid is one reason this is taking place. As a result of this work, 54% of students who are not at standard and either ELA or math increase by one or more proficiency levels of, in that area. Our intentional work has helped students make progress academically. There are many things working well for the students at McAuliffe. Our staff is committed to continuing the great work that has been taking place at our school. It's important that we also seek out and identify other factors that may impact student performance as we move forward. Lastly, this year we are implementing a school equity team that will help us better support all students. I'd like to thank you for giving us an opportunity to share about the exciting work taking place at McAuliffe. We appreciate the support of the school board, Superintendent Stavum, and the many talented people who work in the Lake Washington School District. And I must say, as a principal who's worked at McCall for nine years, um, as a dad who has students who attend Lake Washington schools, many of our uh, teachers as well have students that have attended Lake Washington, um, we could, we're, we're very fortunate and very lucky to, to work here. And so, uh, with that being said, I'd like to say uh, thank you for having us and go Challengers. Are there any questions or anything anybody has or? No? All right, well thank you very much. That was fabulous. I appreciate the video. That was awfully fun to be able to see your kids as well in action and, and your talking points and fun to hear all the different ways that you're improving student learning. So thank you very much. Thank you guys. So the next item on our agenda is public comment. And we do not currently have anybody signed up for public comment, so I, I will ask if there's anybody in the audience who meant to sign up for public comment but did not have the opportunity. So seeing no one, I will go on. So the next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. So I will now entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Director La Liberty and seconded by Director Carlson. Dr. Stabum, will you pour, pull the board? Cassandra. Yes. Eric? Yes. Chris? Yes. Mark? Yes. Siri? Yes. And Dr. Stephen, if you could review the donations, please. I certainly can. This month, we have a number of things to note, and with great appreciation, I will read the following items. Barbara and Christopher Kaler to Emerson K-12 in the amount of 3000 to purchase classroom supplies. Juanita Schools Foundation to Juanita Elementary in the amount of $17,337.25 to provide choir and technology stipends, purchase accelerated reader and star reading subscriptions, and support volunteer programs. WMEA Music Matters to Muir Elementary in the amount of $3,634 to purchase musical instruments. Redmond Elementary, PTSA to Redmond Elementary in the amount of $1,319.34 to purchase RAS Kids, which is Reading Enrichment Site License. Kirkland Parks Foundation to Redmond Middle School in the amount of $2,000 for STEM Challenge Awards to provide support for club activities. And finally, Eastlake High School, PTSA to Eastlake High in the amount of $3,800 to provide math lab support 
for a total generous donation to our district in the amount of $31,090.59. Thank you to those donations. Yes, thank you so much. We'd like to personally thank everyone who has chosen to support our students in our schools. We wouldn't be able to provide these opportunities without this type of support, so thank you very much. So the first item on our non-consent agenda is the authorization to sell bonds. So Dr. Stapham, if you could. Yes, and I'm gonna ask Barbara Posthumus, Associate Superintendent for our Business and Support Services to step forward and she can give us some good context around this. Okay, so resolution 2257 authorizes the sale of $68 million um, from our bonds to reduce overcrowding and enhance student learning environments. These were the bonds that were approved by voters in April of 2016. We have, um, I forgot, I need to put my glasses on so I can read. Um, so this is our third uh, bond sale from those bonds. Uh, the first sale was in August of 16, 2016. The second sale was in November of 2017. And then this is the third sale of those bonds. And then in addition, in addition this resolution authorizes the sale of the remaining $11 million of the bonds that were approved by voters in February of 2006. Um, the use of these bonds was repurposed in October of 2014. Um, we had a public hearing at that time and they were repurposed to be used for short-term capacity projects, which included portables, um, upgrades to classroom, future bond planning, um, internal building modifications and property acquisition. Um, Given that our 2018 bond measure did not receive the 60% voter approval, uh, these remaining two uh, bonds from 2006 um, will provide funds to support critical capacity projects um, and uh, future property acquisition. Um, so this re resolution is what's called a delegating resolution. Um, we have not yet sold the bonds, but the resolution delegates um, the superintendent um, or uh, the associate superintendent, myself, um, to authorize our bond underwriter, who DA David, David Tregister from DA Davidson is here, um, to market the bonds uh, within certain parameters. Um, so it allows us to time the sale of the bonds uh, to align with favorable market conditions. Um, it also provides flexibility in the timing. Um, so we do uh, anticipate the sale to be in mid-November, but again, that can change depending on market timing. Um, the district's bond council, uh, who is here also today, Cynthia Weed from KNL Gates, um, has reviewed the resolution and it is in legal compliance. Um, and then once the bonds uh, pr uh, are sold, then they, we do have that bond sale reviewed by our independent financial advisor, Northwest Municipal Advisors. Scott Bauer is here also. Um, and to make sure prior to the sale, to make sure um, the best interests of the district are represented so um, we are recommending that the board authorize or adopt this resolution. May I have a motion? I move we adopt. Or second. We move the sale. Okay, so it's a move by Director Stewart and second by Director La Liberty to adopt resolution number 2257 authorizing the issuance of sale of unlimited tax general obligation bonds. Now I will open it to any discussion or questions. So we've already got resolution 2243 out there authorizing the 68. I, um, the, uh, the resolution, I think there's that, uh, the, in this situation, I think that should say resolution 2257. Okay. So that's, that's, what I was wondering. that's thank you for, I just noticed that as I was coming up. So that should be 2257. Okay. So the um, bonds that we're proposing to sell are the residual bonds from the February 2006 mm -hmm. f election. Uh, and the total amount of those bonds is? So from the, in 2000, the 2006 election, yeah. the total amount is, was three, 436 million and we um, sold 425 million for a remaining balance of 11 million. Okay, that's where I was just trying to figure out whether it was in the 79 or the 11, and, uh, 11 million. Mm -hmm. I have had enough input on this at this point. 
Any other questions or discussions? With that, then we will take a... So all those in favor of the motion to adopt resolution number 2257, authorizing the issuance and sale of unlimited tax general obligation bonds of the district in the aggregate principal amount of up to 79 million as presented. Please signify by voting aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. So our second item on the non-consent agenda is the monitoring report for ENDS results to literacy and language. To just give a quick introduction on these, these are the outcomes in which we evaluate the performance of the organization. And tonight's we'll be focusing on literacy and language. So this is a piece where the board is hearing sort of how things are going and being able to look to see what some of the future focus and priorities might be. So we appreciate the work that goes into these to get these prepared for the board to be able to review. So thank you very much. With that, I will turn it over. And I'm just gonna turn it over to Matt Monabianco <laughs> for the report. It's on it is. <laughs> thank you very much. I also want to introduce to you, so you're recognizing the person behind the work, uh, Tim Krieger, who is our Director of Evaluation Assessment and Research. Uh, Tim is the one who is the person behind Power BI and also the person that ac actually helps us to make sure that we've got the most accurate data and are, and are uh, in line with that. And so I asked Tim to join us tonight in case we get into some questions about the actual data itself in terms of any statistical things that come up. We can always turn to him and I will do that, some of the statistical things. So uh, this is our public report of a written report which we gave you last week. And um, I've highlighted some of the information that's in that written report for you in presentation style. Uh, just to begin with, we're also connecting our ends with our means. And our ends are certainly the outcomes of what we want to see for our students in terms of what we want them to know and be able to do. The means or the executive limitations are the strategies that we use, the methods to achieve those ends. I've highlighted for you, we're talking about ER2, of course, which is literacy and language and the connection to the executive limitation is academic program, often, uh, I'm sorry, EL7. This unpacks ER2 in a little more detail, and you can see the four bullets, which would be at a very high level, what we wanna see for our graduates, which are also identified in our student profile. On the right-hand side, 7-1, are the specific uh, subcategories under the develop and implement an academic program that specifies those things. We start with just an introduction. This was not in your written materials. It's a review of what is our literacy program at each of the levels. I'm gonna start with a high level of elementary. Uh, our students spend between nine and 10 hours a week in reading, writing, speaking, and listening instruction. The core instructional materials that we adopted and started in implementation in 13-14 are Wonders. We also use Wonders Reading and Writing Workshop. We also have other supplemental materials that are used in safety net and special education to support wonders instruction uh, for our core. Additional supporting resources, some of which I wanna highlight that are new this year that apply to all levels, and I brought some notes so that I stay on track. Clicker 7 reading and writing accessibility software. Um, licenses were purchased for all elementary students and teachers. Clicker 7 is a word processor that offers literacy support such as word prediction, picture support, and text to speech. In addition, it offers engaging literacy activities so that we're building the confidence and independence of our students. Licenses for Read and Write 12 accessibility software was also purchased not only for elementary but for secondary students as well. So it's available for all of our students. It is a floating toolbar that offers students reading and writing support in a variety of applications and software, including Word, OneNote, and Internet Explorer. It includes features also as text-to-speech, a dictionary picture dictionary, screen masking, highlighting, and collection tools, and a vocabulary list builder. We have Lexia Literacy software also being used as a supporting resource and the next time of our adoption for elementary implementation year, which is when is it actually in the classrooms, is 2023-24 school year. At the middle level, students spend 250 minutes weekly in instructional time around the core. We are using um, Prentice Hall Literature and Prentice Hall Writing Coach 
We also are using right source to support seven and eight. I'm not gonna repeat what I said because it applies to the same clicker seven and read and write 12. They're also assigned or specific novels at each grade level. The last adoption was in 07, 08. The planned implementation is 21, 22. The high school level, students are required to take four years, four credits of English to graduate. Uh, in nine through 11, the courses include world and American literature. Grade 12 includes literature, written comp, AP English and literature is offered in grades 11 and 12. The sources are, as you see, literature and language, Prentice Hall literature and literature and language arts, similar supporting resources, as I said, for secondary. Next planned implementation would be the 2021 school year. We now move to the data that was provided you in the written report. Again, these are at a fairly high level. You recall that the end result was divided into three parts, and I do wanna say this is following the new format that we used when we reported ER1 to you, so it's in that format. Uh, part one is primary, part two is intermediate, and part three is the high school. In ENDS policy, we're looking at policy criteria, the observable conditions, the alignment to the ends, targets and rationale, and sufficient evidence toward meeting um, our outcomes or our ends. I'm gonna break those down here in some finer detail. So when we look at the policy criteria and the observable conditions, how those are aligned to ends, these are three criteria. The achievement in primary literacy and language is interpreted as demonstrating skills of pre-K through grade three. The primary literacy and language program is founded on our English Common Core state standards, which are also our Washington state standards and of course our district standards. Those are the ones that define our reading, writing, speaking and listening knowledge and skills. Achievement in primary literacy and language has been shown to have a significant effect on students' future school success. In terms of our targets, our target is for 95% of our kindergartners to demonstrate school readiness, and that's measured on the WAKIDS assessment, it's also measured on end of year DIBBLES, and it's measured on our third grade student, or uh, SBA English language arts. The sufficient evidence threshold is at the 85% level, where we're looking at 85% or more of our students demonstrating uh, standard uh, performance on the WA kids, Dibbles, kindergarten, and grade three, smarter balanced. We're also looking for a positive trend, and if there isn't a positive trend, no more than a 2% decline of the trend. Given such a high aspirational level of 95% achievement, uh, we established that minimum threshold of 85% uh, by student group, together with criteria of comparable performance that we're looking at, and year-to-year -year improvement is giving us what we determine is sufficient evidence of reasonable progress toward accomplishment of that end. Any group, as you know from our ENDS work, that doesn't meet these established criteria, we provide evidence that full achievement of the end has not been accomplished. We call those out, we start to look in, and dig deeper into what's going on there. I'm gonna start with part one of the monitoring results. When we look at all student groups and uh, grade three, the grade three students maintain their overall high performance with 81% meeting or exceeding standard. The all student group rank, when we look at comparative districts, 49 of the largest districts in the state, we would rate, we rank thir first of our third grade in those 49. Overall, the students who entered kindergarten are slightly less school ready in language and literacy last year than they were in the prior year as measured by the WAKIDS whole child assessment. The performance on the end of the year Dibbles kindergarten results had been on a positive trend as you can see there starting with 85% and continuing to 90% in 2017. It dipped down uh, to 86% uh, for the first time after four years of a uh, upward trajectory. Monitoring results show consistently high levels of performance within these groups, Asian, two or more races, and white students. We see gaps present for these four specific groups when disaggregated, Hispanic, Latino, I'm sorry I said four and it's actually five, Hispanic, Latino, black African American students, 
students who are receiving special education services, students receiving ELL, and students from low-income households. I'm gonna go through each of those now in the next series of slides dedicated to each one, starting with race and ethnicity. Our Asian students perform higher than other races and ethnicity groups in all measures. We see performance gaps between kindergarten and grade three, recognizing that we are using Dibbles at kindergarten and SBA at grade three, and yet when you look at going from K to three, there's a drop for Hispanic, Latino, and black African American. I said drop and I meant gap, and I want to be accurate there. Our Hispanic, Latino grade three students rank seven among the 49 largest districts in their performance. Performance gaps persist in special education. A uh, similar pattern between kindergarten and grade three is shown in the charts. Our grade three students receiving special ed services are ranked fifth among the 49 largest districts. In terms of ELL, what has held true for us for the last several years, students who have exited ELL services continue to outperform current and never receiving ELL services. Performance gaps persist similarly to what we saw in the previous groups between grade three, I'm sorry, between kindergarten and grade three. Our third grade students receiving ELL services rank fourth among the 49 largest districts in the state. When we look at low income, similarly the gaps persist between kindergarten and grade three. Grade three students from low income households ranked 10th among the 49 largest districts. I'm gonna continue this with part two and part three and at any point that you feel that you want me to, I'll look and double check to make sure that there's questions. Yes. I think we have some, so let's go ahead. Just a quick question on the, um, first of all, thank you. And mm -hmm. Tim, I can't tell you how much time I spend on Power BI. It's like my new video game. <laughs> on the supports that you mentioned, the word prediction um, and picture support for the Clicker 7 and the Read and Write 12, mm -hmm. I'm assuming for elementary students up through third grade, they don't take their laptops home, is that correct? That's correct. So they probably can't work on that at home. But I'm looking to the okay. back of the room because they are familiar with the licenses themselves in terms of access from home and they have greater familiarity. So I'm gonna ask Mike Van Orden to speak to that since he's most familiar with it. So we do have the ability to um, offer licenses that students could actually load on a home device or um, one of their own devices. So if they don't have a device to take home, they can. Um, particularly where we, we're seeing the benefit though would be for our intermediate students for the uh, home access. Okay, that's great. Is it additional cost? Is it much more to no, do? It's no, it's part of the license structure that we got. Oh, that's fantastic. Mike, when it comes to the ability to take it home, are we also, you know, I'm, this may sound a little bit shallow, but are we also providing the parents of the instruction, if you will, on how to use those materials once they come home? Because I can see something coming home that look very foreign to what they may be mm -hmm. used to in other programming, but uh, I'm still recalling back to my first grade when I came home with new math and my mother said, you're on your own kid. Right. Uh, so it would, I think it would help yeah. perhaps the efforts. Yeah, okay. that'd be great. We have um, our assistive technology specialist as well as our technology integration facilitators that are in each school are working with teachers to provide instructions on how to do all of that and we can pass along that idea of are there some things that we can take home and provide to parents. Remember these are tools though too, so they're not you know, super complex, but they're still that, that first time you see they're something different. and have to learn it, it is a, it is a, a learning curve, so we can okay. provide that. Chris? Uh, sorry, I'm gonna ask Matt to flip back a couple slides. Um, on slide 17, I wanted to congratulate the team for achieving first rank in the state, but I, <laughs> I'm distressed when we set an, an, an aspirational goal of 95%, a reduced goal of 85%, and this is what we call in statistics a flat line. Um, we are at 80%, period. Um, that means that one in five of our third graders is not ready to move on from the transition of learning to read to reading to learn. Um, that, even if it's the best in the state, it boggles my mind that we can't move this number. 
And I'm curious about what strategies, I mean, what more can we throw at this system or what insights have we got as to where that's coming from? Why can't we make that number move? I think there's a number of things and um, I think you're very astute to notice the flat line of it and I think sometimes we come a little complacent when we're in first place. I think there are some things that we need to look at with alignment and with deep implementation of our curriculum. I also think that um, when you look at how we are targeting interventions and making sure that we have the most qualified people providing those interventions to students and as somebody new kind of with a new lens on it, having come from a um, place that had wonders implemented, um, have a little bit more experience with that, but we've been begun talking about those things and how are we sharing best practices within our district where we see individual schools making gains to make sure that people are looking at the practices that are effective and really looking at deep instructional fidelity as well as fidelity with our curriculum. So those are some of the areas. And um, the other thing that I often think about is a teacher who is very experienced at teaching reading and then when we have a number of new teachers and the onboarding process that happens with brand new teachers, teaching reading is rocket science and we have to account for how we help new teachers who may have had some work in pre-service um, programs of being a great reading teacher, but we also have a, an obligation as a district to make sure that those brand new teachers are developing those skills. So I think we have a lot of areas where we can continue to push on to get that line to move up. So on a related note, actually, and I, I appreciate that you skipped forward to try and give me an answer, but 20, slide 22 is my next compliment slash question. Um, I absolutely love slide 22 for the fact that the ELL results that we're seeing, breaking that out, this, this is the sort of data that shows me that a program's working. Um, as a matter of fact, it makes me wonder if we wanted to get to 85%, um, maybe we should just apply ELL to everyone. Um, but all kidding aside, um, this is, is great. If you flip forward to slide 23, um, when we talk about SPED, I don't know what to make of these numbers. Um, it, 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 oh, sorry, 23 is low income. There I have another point to make. Um, yeah, so 21 was, was, yeah, you're right, 21 was SPED, where I don't know if we're doing well or not because I don't know how, what our mix is of the various classes of least restrictive environment. Um, if we're talking about specific learning disabilities or we're talking about Down syndrome, what I consider success is different things. Um, and I just always find the special ed report, part of these reports unsatisfying because I, I know there's a gap, but I don't know what it means and I don't know whether it worries me. Um, all right, so now forward to slide 23. That's the one where I'm really, you can see a gap for our low-income students that grows dramatically in kindergarten and third grade. In kindergarten, they're behind by about 15%. By third grade, they're behind by about 33%. That's a big deal. They're falling off of this train at a rate that's twice what anyone else is. It's a great opportunity for us to intervene. But it's also something where, you know, when we're down, if, if one in eight kids in our district is low income and half of them aren't at standard by grade three, we're failing a large number of low income kids. And this is, a, this is from a public health standpoint, is one of those leverage points that I would love to see some focus on cracking this nut. What supports do these families and students need to help the kids so that by the time they get to third grade, they haven't fallen off the train? I would like to just interject one comment there that it would be interesting to see a pre-K slide and look at um, the importance of that trajectory if all kids were given universal preschool with language development and high quality early learning experiences. So I think this is direct evidence of our need to continue pushing on that. Director Stewart. Uh, going back to Chris's point on the special needs uh, students and the variations, uh, I'm not seeing, and maybe I'm missing the point here, what, if you can give us a picture of, uh, on literacy and language, on what can you give us kind of a, an overview or a specifics on the nonverbal kids? 
because that's again that is it makes a major impact uh, of an assessment when you have the nonverbal uh, students and it's not there and that would have a major impact on your overall number to be quite frank and so if we knew what we were doing there or if we were informed what we we're doing there that'd be very helpful um, and one other point to go back to my other question on uh, you know are you teaching the parents so to speak um, I don't know if it's changed but a few years ago there was a program and I don't know if we're still using it called read and write gold mm -hmm. the student wasn't told how to use it the teacher didn't know how to use it and the parents sure as hell didn't know how to use it mm -hmm. and so if that's just one situation where it was a perfect storm for it was useless mm -hmm. So if I could just quickly summarize really fast so I make sure we have the key points from what I'm hearing here. There's one, there's on the assistive technology just to sort of in, ensure that we're making sure parents and families also know how to use it and make sure that that's sort of built in. I guess that's what I'm sort of hearing um, from what's happening here. That the flat line is the concern um, and those addresses there. I'd also add one piece that wasn't mentioned was we're doing a lot with curriculum instruction, but there is a lot around the opportunity piece and where's the experiential hands-on component in which to bring this forward and bring that literacy and language to life. So that's the other piece I'd be interested in learning a little more about. But that's sort of the key is I guess that third grade reading seems to be the key point that's being said to here. And then specifically in the low income category that was called out in that regards. And then the other piece that came out was in special education and that there's the issue of trying to look at that specific learning disability and how that breaks out. And I believe that we get at both the nonverbal and the other components that are there. Is that a fair summary of the it, discussion it is. points? I think, the, I think the point, especially that Chris started and I followed up with, is the idea that you can't look at special education kids as one lump. They're not. Uh, right, and so that's the idea of just it requesting a different, a different type of breakout. So I, and so this will happen in the other ones too, so I just wanna make sure we have it so we don't need to revisit it, because this will just hold over through all of them, because I think we'll find that to be true. Um, and I think that's it, so I would like you to go on from there. So I thank will do you that, for and I'd like to us. add just one more item to your summary, which Dr. Stavum already mentioned is that even though we may be ranked very high among those 49 districts, these results are still very sobering for us and it doesn't lead to complacency, it leads to the same kind of uh, questioning of ourselves and strategies system-wide of what are we doing and what do we need to do better. Just because we're fifth in this case with special ed is not good enough when we see flat lines occurring to real people. And as I'm reminded actually by Tim, there are children behind these numbers and it's always important to be reminded of that. If, if I may, sorry, I just thought of one other thing. Um, with all of this, I think the focus in addition, and you'll see this at the end, is that focus on dyslexia um, mm -hmm. and noting that that work has really just begun this year mm -hmm. in a lot of that focus. So ideally some of that impact hopefully will play out through here, but that will take time in which to build that into the system. But that was a big, Big piece, so I would say if that continues, that would be one piece I would highlight into is the continued focus in really addressing the dyslexia component, since that is one of the biggest reading issues. I'm gonna move to part two, because I'm being signaled to do that now as our intermediate focus. Uh, very similar approach, I'm not gonna read all of the words on here. Uh, we're now looking at the need to make sure we have a solid middle level program to prepare those students for high school. Uh, we also are obviously continuing to use the Common Core State Standards, and we're looking at um, reading, writing, speaking, and listening in those areas. The aspirational goal remains at 95% of meeting or exceeding standards. Our uh, threshold is 85% or more uh, in grades five and eight, smarter balance. We're looking for a positive trend. If there isn't one, no more than a 2% decline over a three-year period. Um, that is, the next slide is very similar to what I had shared with you and the primary group applies here as well. Overall, our students in grades five and eight demonstrate very high performance in English language arts and literacy as you saw in our overall third grade slide. The all students group performances remain stable. Uh, 
It could also be considered a flat line, and using uh, the word that was used before, because it's hovered at 84 and 83, went to 85 one year. Both grades five and eight rank one among the 49 largest districts in the state. Similar pattern, um, as you can see, uh, the gaps in performance are in Hispanic, Latino, black African American students, students receiving special ed, ELL, and low income. When we look at the gaps between our grades five, when the students are proceeding between grades five and eight, uh, they uh, uh, continue to, to be there. Um, even though we are, as I said before, ranked fifth and eighth, that's not good enough when we look at how do we close those gaps for those students. When we look at special education students receiving special education services, it persists as well, similar to what we saw in the primary pattern. Uh, students receiving services ranked first for grade five and for grade eight ranked fifth among the 49 largest districts in the state. Introducing a new view, which is the class of 2022 cohort data, and looking at over time, what's happening is that that gap increases, and that is disturbing for us, like between grades five and eight. It's not getting closer, it's getting wider. The good news on our next slide, as we go back up and down here, exited ELL students continue to outperform our current ELL students and perform similarly or better than students who were never ELL. Uh, our grade five students receiving ELL services rank second in the state, and our grade eight students rank fifth among the 49 largest districts in the state. I have some theories about why this is happening, but the real pro behind this is Kelly Peace, and so I'm not going to call her up, but uh, at some point you may hear more during her safety net intervention presentation of what's going on, so I don't want to steal the wind. I know that she has some jewels that she'll be sharing with you, but that's the teaser coming attraction. <laughs> when we look at uh, the class of 2022 cohort data for students receiving ELL services, um, the achievement gap increases similar to what we saw with other groups between grades five and eight. But working with Tim today, I knew you would ask what's going on and so what we saw was there were 86 students in this cohort in grade five. They were ELL at the time of the test in grade five. Only 33 of that 86 were still in the cohort by the time grade eight came along to take the test. So these are students that are having some pretty significant issues with language acquisition which is contributing not as an excuse, but as what's going on behind the scenes. So it's not 86 at five and 86 at eight, which I started to do myself in trying to figure out what's, what's happening here, why is that so uh, dropping off so much, but wanted to tweak that out. When we look at low income, the gaps persist between five and eight, similar to other patterns we've seen. Uh, even though we rank 13th and 22nd, 5th and 8th, among the largest 49, we have work there as well. The class of 2022 cohort uh, for students from low income shows that the achievement gap remains fairly constant. Um, constant is flat. It went from 54 to 50, 48 to 53. Move right into part three, if I could, or do you want me to pause? Yes. If we can go back to page 33, or sl slide 33, I guess. I think when you look at this persistent gap with, uh, with SPED students, I think what you're looking at, a lot of it, one is communication skills, mm -hmm. but two, it, in the elementary school in particular, kids are not encouraged or allowed to take home equipment to be able to then uh, to uh, practice what they've learned or to share what they've learned. So the parents can be involved. I mean, we, we jump up and down about parents not being involved all the time, but if you don't allow them to have the same tools at home that they have in the classroom, you're never gonna achieve what you wanna achieve. And that's been going on for years and years. Um, and if we go to the low income numbers on slide 37, 
Mark, if I could respond just. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, actually, I'm, what I wanted to say is, I'm taking notes on what you're saying, and I'm wanting to follow up, and likely will be in a brief or great. Uh, a follow up to find out what's happening with the ability for students to I, check out equipment. So. I just want you to know that I'm, if I'm quiet here no, no. and I'm writing notes, I want to follow up and I find didn't expect out. you to have that all between your ears. Go ahead. Uh, 37? 37. This is extremely disturbing that we're at 13th and 22nd. And I hope it's not telling me what, I'm, what my gut's telling me. My gut tells me is that we have a very affluent district, and if the low-income students don't cut it well, at least we get all of our uh, high-income students with high AP scores and so forth, and it bothers me that we're not making it. Uh, this group is especially near and dear to my heart. I grew up in that area, and it ticks me off that we can't give as much effort to our low-income students as we do to our AP students. It's those students could potentially be, many of them could potentially be your AP students if you don't give them the opportunities and help them enough in elementary, they're never going to get on a different path. Director Carlson, Director of Liberty. Well, Sir Carlson. I think, I'm, I think we're probably about to I was going to let him have first crack at it and then I'll... Okay. No, Chris, you got to go ahead. Okay. I, I, no, no, I, I think, so on slide 30, just the beginning of this, um, I, this is fascinating to me, um, having acknowledged that the not lines are flat. That's bad news. Good news is we're still in first place, uh, from third to fifth to eighth. And what's even more fascinating to me is that we're stable. That is, if, we've still, if we had them in third grade, we've got 80% in fifth grade, and we've got 80% in eighth grade. The getting the kids on the bus is, seems to be the opportunity here rather than, and once they're on the bus, keeping them on the bus, we're doing a great job, but there's this loss of one in five kids by the time they got to the third, and they're, they're lost, which is even more apparent. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I love a nice flat line that still has a trend to it, and that's on slide 37, where Mark was pointing out the low-income kids. That low-income gap is the same gap we had in third grade. The half of low-income kids who are, do, who are at standard and above standard remain at standard and above standard. So it's really about that early end of the system, that getting the pipeline, if a kid is not at standard at third grade, we seem to have, on average, lost them long-term. But we're not losing more kids. So that's a real opportunity for us to intercede at the early end to make sure that the pipeline has more success to begin with. Um, so I, I'm with Mark that I care about that particular group. It's not really acceptable to have, I mean, it's a little bit more than 5% of the district that would be low income and not at standard by third grade. But they're, those kids, if we can help provide supports to them, it provides a major boost. I mean, honestly, that's an opportunity for us as a whole to invest in raising the overall performance of the district. So, anyway. Ready? Just the one thing I would add is it, our, the achievement gap does continue to grow from third to fifth to eighth, I'll, slightly, but there is, I mean, by eighth grade, it's 40, at least in this last year, it was 41%. Yeah, I was, I was discounting the overall trend because that's one where it, the chopsticks happen to have skewed right at the edge. Um, overall, it's just about a 40% gap, and it was a 33, 35% gap in third grade. There's not a whole lot of difference going on here. Quick question. Do very many special education students' parents waive them from standardized tests? Because I know we have done that in the past when it seemed like it was an overwhelming amount of work to expect. That would be a question I'd want to follow up on. I, I don't know the exact percent. Rate is actually pretty small. It's less than 2%. That's overall. It's pretty small. Thank you. One second. Um, I'd just like the opportunity because everybody's had theirs, so I'd like mine. Um, so I would like to say that there is a lot of efforts with our, with our subpopulation, with our low-income group, with our Title I schools. So there is a lot of efforts. And I would echo that I believe everyone in our district 
looks towards this and really wants to make sure how do we shift this and how do we do it differently. So I want to recognize that that is really there across the board. I mean, the board to the leadership to every teacher in that classroom. We know all kids matter. It's every student, every student first. So I appreciate the willingness to really dive into this and look at this and then work to find what those changes and differences are. So I just wanted to make sure we highlighted that piece as well. Um, and I would echo, so as I'm hearing the conversation and what I'm seeing here yet again, is there sort of a piece of really, again, we want to see that third, that we're speaking again to the lower grades when it talks to language and literacy. Again, we're going back to what's happening down there. Dr. Steven did mumble in my ear quietly about, well, you know, a one-to-one -one initiative at the lower grades could address some of those accessibility pieces and that taking home piece. So I just thought, that, so as we talk about this and we think about these things, that's sort of the, you know, the early learning that we spoke about prior and those things. That's where we start to think about where do we focus our time, energies, and thinkings, and, and focus. So I think those are some of the big pieces rising from here. I, perhaps I, let me be a little specific, especially on the lower income kids. It's not the fact that we're not having efforts be made. It's like the, the the hamster on the wheel, it's a hell of a lot of effort being put into it, but there's not a whole lot being accomplished, is it, what it looks like. You're getting to about half of them, but that's still you know, half empty, half full. And I'm gonna be on the half empty side on this one. Uh, also, going back to the question about assessments for the SPED students, especially the nonverbals, um, in 12 years, you know, I'll say 10, because we have to move here in second grade, there is no assessment that could detect or de determine literacy in nonverbal kids that they found or would use. So maybe we need to be a little more detective oriented and a little more research oriented to find uh, programs that can be, uh, or tests that can be, because it wasn't so much the parents wanted to opt out, it was the idea that, they, that none of the tests were valid. Any additional questions on that piece? All right, then we are, we'll move forward. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay. Go. Absolutely. The final part is uh, achievement at the high school level. And early and not so similarly, now we're switching to uh, realizing the importance of how this all builds, success in high school builds towards post-secondary pathways. Uh, four credits are required for graduation. One of our uh, observable conditions is looking at our ninth graders and are they on track to graduate and ensuring that they have earned uh, a full credit in English language arts by the end of ninth grade. Additionally, we're looking at the seal of biliteracy as another observable condition which demonstrates language readiness and is measured by the accelerated placement exam or a world language competency assessment. Hi. Um, what is the word I want? Aspirational goal, excuse me, of 95% of our 10th graders meeting or exceeding, 95% of our 9th graders earning full credit, and 95% achieving the Washington State seal of biliteracy. As before, the 85% threshold uh, is there with a positive trend and no more than a 2% decline for each of those areas. As we look at the results, 96% of our ninth graders overall attained full ELA credit in their freshman year. 89% of them are performing at or exceeding standard on the grade 10 ELA SBA. And my understanding is that just moved to 10th grade this past year. And that's why there's no trend, the data there yet and only one year reported. 8.5% of the class of 2018 attained the Washington State Seal of Biliteracy. That's an increase from 2.1 in the previous year. When we analyze results for race and ethnicity, each group demonstrates greater success at the high school level than in primary or intermediate literacy. However, achievement gaps are still present for many of our, our groups. 94% of our black African American students attained full ELA credit in grade nine at the highest level over a five year period. 
gaps still exist for grade 10 on the same measure, or the same group, rather, using the different measure, ELA-SBA. 88% of our students receiving special ed services attained full ELA credit in grade nine. The gaps still exist when you look at their SBA score um, of 49.7% on the SBA grade 10. 88% of our students are receiving, who are receiving ELL services earned full ELA credit, and the gaps are still there for those that are still receiving ELA services and have not exited. 83% of our students from low income earned full ELA credit, and yet 61.9% were either meeting or exceeding standard at the time of the test for the grade 10. I move into the connection I almost did earlier when asked the question, what are you doing about it? And this is the what are you doing about it? Each year we try different ways of displaying the what are you doing about it? And this year is no different than the past. Uh, partly being asked if we would break it out differently last year as a board. And so we did that in the next two slides. We were asked, what are the things you're initiating? Like, what are you starting this year that you weren't doing before? And that's this slide. And then the next slide is, what are you scaling? What are you deciding to not only continue, but expand upon? And so I tried to do this, and uh, there's nothing magical about the three categories. I just was thinking about the strategies themselves, and rather than just list a, a whole list, some of them really strongly support all three. Core instruction, we know that if students are not in core instruction, that's gonna set them back. So ensuring that every student is in core instruction is critical. Access, when accessing core is challenging, what are we doing to provide access points or resources so that those students can access core curriculum? And then what are we doing for equity? And so I'm just gonna hit these at a high level. We implemented this year a newly adopted preschool curriculum that is vertically aligned with wonders better than the previous curriculum. So we know that in preschool, which is critical to the success in kindergarten, by having a strongly aligned, coherent curriculum that will lead right into what they're doing in wonders, it increases their likelihood of being successful. We are evaluating progress monitoring tools this year for math and behavior goals. In access, I'm not going to go in the detail about Clicker 7 and Read and Write 12, which I already did, but I'm gonna to speak to the ones that I didn't speak to before. This fall, I would say some very intensive, would be the word I'd use, efforts were done on the part of our directors, specialists, with all of our elementary teachers, all, means all, not just specialists, in understanding dyslexia, what dyslexia looks like, what it's not, what it is, how teaching our reading curriculum and teaching using the resources provided can meet the needs of students who are starting to display symptoms of dyslexia or showing some dyslexic issues. We've also provided training for our school psychologists to identify dyslexia. We're reinforcing, meaning that we've had picture exchange communication system and it's kind of a reboot of to how that could be a very strong access point for students who are not meeting success uh, without supports. This year, uh, you've heard it mentioned already uh, in the home host school report, we are initiating school-based equity teams, and part of the work they're doing in that equity team, equity team is asking the questions that Brady actually asked. Why are our fifth graders dropping off. That's a part of the questioning that is going to go on within an equity team of what's happening that's getting in the way of achievement. And providing staff training focused on culturally relevant instruction is also, was also a large piece of the work we did this fall during leap days with staff. This would be sort of the strategies we think show promise of success and are being initiated this year. The ones that we've seen some track record on that we're continuing to expand on uh, in the same areas, I'm gonna speak again, providing training to all elementary staff on foundational literacy instruction. 
I happened to be in that training, both with principals and with teachers, and having them reminded that we have a common curriculum with some common instructional routines that exist kindergarten through fifth grade in Wonders, and reminding people at all levels that this is known to make a difference for students if you're actually teaching the core instruction and providing them with the fidelity of what we've adopted. Continuing to identify students with risk factors for early literacy acquisition at the preschool level. So as I heard earlier, catching them early before third grade and seeing it as early as preschool. Continuing to implement the co-teaching model to enable students access uh, by having special ed, ELL, and safety net services working together with general ed services. Continuing to provide free summer school to ensure that students who are not at standard in reading, finances is not an obstacle. Expanding our training for teachers in sheltered instructional observation protocol, or PSYOP, is a strategy that is not just for struggling learners or EL learners, but is something that was mentioned, I believe, by Chris, maybe not. If it's working for the EL exited students, then maybe it works for all students. And so we're training all of our teachers, not just a select group, but all of our elementary teachers is the focus right now on the PSYOP strategies. All of our teachers. Did I say elementary? Secondary, too. Yeah, thank you. So in conclusion, um, we would say that a reasonable interpretation includes observable conditions, targets, the rationale that aligns with end policy, represents appropriate targets, while sufficient evidence exists to demonstrate that the three parts of the policy have been achieved for the all group and some student groups, the evidence also demonstrates only reasonable partial achievement toward the ENDS policy interpretation for the other identified groups at this point in time. And that is the end of the presentation, so I'll entertain questions or comments. Okay, Jesse. Director Stewart? Can we go back to slide 46, please? I must have had the wrong page. I get it. Let's try 47. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, 46. Uh, when we look at the uh, seal of biliteracy, I know that at least Reb and I, and I, maybe a couple others, offer ASL as a foreign language. Uh, does all the Washington? Do. Pardon? All, all of our schools. All of do. Do. Okay, good. Because at the time they answered, I didn't think that anyone else was, but that's been a few years. Uh, question is Does the seal also include ASL? I have no idea. I'm just curious. Tim, do you want to address that? A student can get the seal of biliteracy through ASL, but to get the seal of biliteracy, you have to either take the world language competency test, so we could offer that, or the AP exam. And I, I don't believe there is an ASL AP okay. exam. Okay, I'm just curious. It so, me to, as so one of one of the the issues with this is students who are in our programs for four years mm -hmm. don't take the world language competency test. So this program is really geared at this point towards students who uh, have a native language that mm -hmm. they have not been taking in the high school. Okay. Well, that is a point that we need to work with the state then to uh, see that that not just the foreign languages that the ASL really needs to have an equal footing of some sort. Uh, my other point was on page 53. Um, as we, the, uh, the access of, on bullet number two, or square number two, I should say, the idea of using the PECs, I think we need to look at the fact that a lot of students in uh, special ed don't work well with the PECs as much as they do perhaps with the, uh, the iPad uh, communication system. Uh, a lot of kids, I mean, I still remember introducing PECs in my home and my, uh, with just the simple thing of uh, french fries or whatever, and he threw the french fries went over his shoulder and said french fries. So uh, I think that we need to look at perhaps using other tools for communication than just PECs. Uh, in particular, uh, the um, I'm going to blank on the name of the program, but there's, uh, with the assistive technology, there's a, uh, I know it has a logo of an owl, but I, that's 
very obtuse, I'm sorry. Um, but using that mm -hmm. earlier and not relying on PECs, granted it's probably cheaper, but cheaper isn't always best. Because if we, that may account for a lot of our uh, flatlining and non-achievement if we're relying on something that just isn't working anymore. Mm -hmm. Director Carlson. Uh, so I, I thank you for the report. This, uh, I mean, we're, we're, it's getting better every year, and I'm closer to, you know, show me the data that answers the questions I came in here with. This is great. Um, and I'm about to ask for two things, but I know that I screwed up because I should have asked for them when we were deciding what belonged in the ER2 report. So. Um, what we've seen in terms of data here has been largely about are we at standard, which to me is a floor. We haven't really, in evaluating ER2, paid any attention to what's the ceiling or high performance. Um, and I do appreciate that we do an AP and Quest report separately, but within the ER2 when we're talking about ELA, I would love to know what are our numbers and our passage rates on the AP comp and AP language tests. Um, let's see how the high end are doing and include that as part of this report. It's not your fault, I forgot to ask for it. We actually report that, Chris, in EL7. Yeah. Uh, specifically to those areas of passage rates of AP and... Um, exactly, and I know that it's in the other spaces, right. but it's part... Siri, do you want to yeah. chime in on this? What I was going to recommend is that is actually a policy change. Yes. And so what I would mm -hmm. recommend that we, we can document that that's an idea of where we'd like to go. Yeah. And then the board can make that decision as to how we put that indicator in and what it's looking for and if that's needed. So I guess that would be what I would recommend. That's fine. Um, I, it makes perfect sense. I just don't want to. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. I don't want you, I don't whip the rug out from under you. I appreciate what you've put yep. here for us. I'm just realizing that there's a piece of this that really, to me, belongs here, and we can have that discussion. Well, because that's a shift in policy. Yeah. The second one is, at the high school level, I, I, this is not the fault of the teachers, but looking at passage rates rather than a standard instrument, uh, we're, we've got a little bit of the Lake Wabigon effect going on. Um, our kids who are passing ninth grade English aren't getting ELA credit on the SBA. Now, I don't mean, that's not really where I want to go with this. There's one piece of data I know that we are funding where I haven't seen a presentation on it previously, and I would love to see that, and that's the PSAT. If we're paying for the students to take the PSAT, that is something where we're applying it broadly. It's a standard instrument and it has national norms, all of those are opportunities for to us to evaluate our ELA performance at the high school level. I would love to see that incorporated, but again, as Siri points out, that's a policy change, but I, I think it's worth discussing. But absolutely, we can put that on to do so. That was actually brought up at the last one as well, and we just didn't have a process in place in order to have that be incorporated, so I think that's something we can look at doing. And the last one, I'm a numbers nerd. Um, when you have, there's only one place that it ever pops up for me is something where I'm like, oh, well, what this, this means something. And that is when we're looking at stratified tables, uh, particularly when we're looking at them by race, ethnicity, um, getting the N for how many people are contributing to each, how many individuals are in each of those categories. Because I know there are big three. I mean, whites are gonna be the dominant group followed by Asian and two or more races, then we have Hispanics, and the reason we see so much more jitter in the African Americans is it's a small population, and just having those N on the slides will be very helpful. They were, are available in the written report, but I know that they don't necessarily align, yeah. so it doesn't make it much easier, but that was there. Um, the other piece, though, just to build on the grade piece that he mentioned, is there any correlation between if I got a B in my language arts class, am I more likely to pass? The, I don't know, have we ever looked at that? Did you want to say we, we could. We, we have it, but it, it wouldn't be that hard. I, if it wouldn't be hard, it might be beneficial. It's part of our invisible students, the B students, the C students, uh, that we really just don't track. I mean, as long as their grades don't fall off the edge of the earth or they don't get in trouble, they just kind of float through and we don't track me. I, it, that's my, my experience of watching it. Director Sage? 
along those same lines, I've been sitting here thinking how much I enjoy looking at all the numbers and trying to extrapolate what does this mean and what are the trends and how can we help. But it also, I guess, bothers me that we're so focused on a test and if we could see a correlation between a classroom grade or if there was some other creative way that we could look at some of these students and the gap. Just food for thought. To build on that, there's the, the book that was mentioned of the opportunity gap um, that was brought up at our Saturday work session. In that, some of these issues actually arise very well to sort of discuss some of this in regards to the testing and how can you look at that in a different way. Um, one on early learning and how you might address that from a policy side. So that might be a place we can start to explore some of those possibilities of what you're speaking to. So this, this last one is just an operational request. Um, I'm in data withdrawal because the usual links that I have on the school board member site for di the data dashboard are stale and I can't get in. And they haven't been replaced with a Power BI link. So I, I, apparently Cassandra has been trained or I wasn't paying attention, I blinked, whatever. I don't know how to get into Power BI and if someone else can get into it, I'm dying to get in there. So please teach me. So that a question. Be, that's going to be accessible to you after this presentation. So that's going to be available with the updated data I'll as well. I'll cede my position to let him to go first. <laughs> okay. So a question I would last ask of the board is, would it be beneficial at some point that we have a study session in working with Power BI and some of that and being able to look through it and go through it or no? I, I, this is not in any sense meant to denigrate my colleagues. It's just that we're going to be in different spaces. Oh, I don't yeah. think that a group session would be useful. This is an individual level. Exactly. I mean, okay, so as long as we yeah. you go ahead, access. Director La Liberty, you look like you have a comment. Yeah, I mean, we can, yes, because I, I, I don't know how to use it. I would like to be able to use it. Okay. And I, I think we can knock that out in 20, 30 minutes. Or possibly the way in which to do that instead is to set up individual opportunities in which to do so. Would you be up to, would that be a feasible option? Okay. So there we go. We can set it up that way on your time. We could also have the basic at, at the study session, and then for those wanting to dig deeper, uh, they could have the individual. It's you know just to get. Okay. You see where I'm going? <laughs> yes. At this point, I think probably the best option is we'll set up individually, so you can individualized instruction. Sometimes the one-on-one -on -one is quicker and faster, so that's okay. We can go that way with it as well. Are there any other comments? Matt has been very patient up there. Um, are there any other comments or questions in regards to ER2? So in looking at that as part of what our process is as we speak to reasonable progress, he, the conclusion was provided as to regards as to that reasonable progress is being made in regards to this with the exceptions in some of those subgroups was sort of put forward. It seems that everybody's pretty well in agreement with that. Yeah. Okay. Do we need a motion to ad adopt that? I can't remember what our process is. Actually, what we're going to do is I will summarize this up into the assertion document. And so at our next board meeting, that will come back. I will add the motion that there is a, that of reasonable progress. And I'll put that in. Um, and then we'll officially adopt. So we'll have the opportunity to discuss it then, any of those things. So I'll highlight some of those big picture items that I put forward there. Does that make sense? Any questions on how that progress, how that works? So it'll come back, it'll be on the non-consent agenda, you have the opportunity to say anything around it, and then we will just do a motion at that point in time if there's not major changes to what's there. That work? All right, so from there, first off, thank you very much for all your work. Um, I have the pleasure of sitting on the data council for Eastside Pathways with Tim Krieger. Um, and his ability to work with that data, and I'm sitting next to him going, well, can you cut it like this? And, and he can. So the great thing is it's really opened up the doors to be able to look at some things and some of those deeper questions that we have. Much as I was having a conversation with, Dr. with Kelly Pease um, about those ELL in the long term and you know who are those, what's the difference, why are they, they there? And so she's saying with the data we can start those things and tease those pieces out. So it's pretty exciting what it's providing and being able to really deliver better instruction and targeting because it's the whole child we're dealing with. So thank you very much for all the work. I know it's a lot of effort in what you do, and it is greatly appreciated from, from our end and being able to see that. So thank you very much. Anything else? Okay, so from that, 
I think we're now moving on to our program reports. Yes, Kelly, are you up for this next one, I believe, for our ELL program report, intervention programs in ELL? I would also um, express my appreciation because as we're doing these reports, they are great for me at the beginning of my tenure to see these. And um, Matt, I think we spent two and a half, three hours enduring my questions before tonight. <laughs> so they are doing a great job. Um, it's, it's, um, we have a lot of possibilities ahead, but I'll turn it over right now to Kelly. There we go. So I want to start with thanking you for allowing me to be the Director of Intervention Services for Lake Washington School District. It is the most rewarding job one could ever hope for, and it's um, flexible and changes so often that it's continuously inspiring. So I just want to make it clear, like, this is the best job in the whole world. So. Um, as we talk about intervention services, we know we're connecting our ends and our means. So you'll hear about our intervention programs and services, which include Safety Net, our English learners, our Native American Alaska Native programs and services, and our Title I programs. And what I want to say about intervention programs is it's, I'm very fortunate to work with these four programs in particular, and are, we're able to connect the, the systems and processes to help and support students in each of these programs because we know from the data we've seen, we have students who are served in safety net who are also EL students who also are potentially Native American, Alaska Native. So the interconnectivity and being able to provide a consistent, guaranteed, and viable experience for our students is imperative. So as we talk about safety net, we serve students K-5 in programs wh who students demonstrate they're below or well below on the Dibbles assessment. And then as students matriculate into third, fourth, and fifth grade, they are, we use SBA data. And if a student shows, demonstrates lack of proficiency on the reading claim on SBA, we dig in deeper to find out what, ex what specifically we give local assessment to those students. What we find is we want every student, as was addressed earlier, to receive strong core foundational literacy instruction in the Gen Ed classroom. And we've worked over time to ensure at the elementary level that um, our, gen, our safety net curriculum resources and our EL curriculum resources are directly aligned to the core instructional resources. So rather than kids having disparate opportunities or disparate experiences when they move from core instruction into safety net or EEL and wonder why are we doing what we're doing, the cross division around a special ed safety net EEL um, teachers and the gen ed teacher align the interventions just in time to what is occurring in core. So we'll either pre-teach or reteach and reinforce the skills. Um, we also at secondary level, we at the middle level, we are, um, we serve students who, as measured by the um, SBA, students who are below standard on the reading claim and overall ELL claim will receive services. What we're doing this year that is uh, we're piloting a program where we've identified students who scored below standard on the reading claim and we've gone in and assessed them again and gotten a Lexile score. We have grouped students based on their Lexile level and put each, most middle schools have a class of 15, about 15 students that are, we're in the process of piloting a dyslexia foundational literacy program in those schools. So we're going to be looking at a couple of different resources over the course of the year to land on a, a tool that will hopefully close that gap from the Chris that you mentioned around kids are falling off the cliff in third grade. So as we think about our high school, we know that the addition of the seven period day adds um, opportunities for kids to recover credits during the class day, during the school day. And so we've built programs based on uh, the student need in each school to help students recover credits just in time. So as we think about a ninth grader ending first semester, we would then cue them in if they ended first semester failing, we would cue them into a credit recovery in combination with their ELL class, if they're ELA course, so they're not, there's not an opportunity to get behind by more than, hopefully we're hoping, a .5 credit. 
So I'm um, building systems to support students as they um, matriculate through the system as a priority. As you can see, our, the numbers in our um, served in safety net have remained fairly constant over the years. You'll see an increase in elementary, and I think that was because we were looking at a more at a deeper level in regard to students not at standard based on the reading claim. Yeah. Sorry, can we just flip back to the last slide just sure. for a moment? Um, the server in elementary is serving students well below or below on benchmark. So those are, uh, I, I'm just trying to remember well below and below, is there an approaching? There is at benchmark yeah. above and above and yep. then below and well below. Okay, so and, and I was so, just worrying that we had yeah. some category that were approaching so, that weren't being served. Right, and you're right to worry about that. And what we, we start with looking at the overall composite score is what we, we reports out on. But then students are assessed in phonics, phonemic awareness, fluency. And so although they might be scoring green, green at benchmark on the overall composite score, we're digging down to that next layer of data to say, okay, this is, it looks like they would be on track for reading success, but how about this? Can we do a quick intervention, five or 10 minutes a day on that first sound fluency or letter naming fluency? Thanks. Yeah. So we know Ideally, and um, I've joked with some of you about if we're doing our job in safety net, we won't have a job, right? And that's our goal. But we also know that there are kids who continuously are enrolling in our district and may not have had the opportunity to be a K, K6, K8 student in the district where they've had a guaranteed and viable curriculum delivery with intentional interventions. So we know that it's supporting and being able to each, we want each teacher in each school to make artful moves to identify who are the kids that need to be served in interventions, what level of intensity, duration, and what tools will they use to get the students by, to standard. And the only way we can do that is if we are, get down to the student level data. So the, um, what's interesting is our EL, as of this morning, we had enrolled 3,007 EL students. Um, fact for, that we find interesting to share is there are 120 lang 21 languages spoken in the district. And out of those 21, English is first, Spanish, Hindi, Telugu, and Russian and Chinese unspecified are our top six language groups. And so if we think about the, the, differ the differences in, yes? Is an Indian, what an Indian language? Yep. So as we think about how we're supporting our kids from a variety of cultures, some of our students, I mean, as you were looking at the data, um, it was, I have some things to share as we get, al get on in the data slides around ELL, but to have a brief conversation about long-term ELs. So our students who qualify for services in EL are um, assessed kids, students new to Lake Washington School District are given an ELPA 21 place screener. Uh, we have about an 82% qualify rate on students who take the assessment that continue in services. Um, and the, and as ki what we see are students new to the country that have had no formal schooling in another language have, um, are qualifying at a higher rate than students who maybe have had, um, they get out of, they exit ELL faster, but the students who have, uh, who are, who have come to us and have stayed with us, we're digging, we're ferreting down what is the granular piece of information that tells us what intervention can we do with that specific subgroup of kids? Because to say an entire group of children are long-term ELs, it's, you, we can't do much with just that information. We need to say, are there cultural groups? Are there, are there socioeconomic implications? Are there, what, what are potentially other barriers that we could sup help break down as they come into our system? So we have, over the past three years, we've um, spent some time with our EL teachers and they would invite a friend to come and learn about co-teaching and how co-teaching, a general ed friend, to come learn about co-teaching. And so we've had, we do a six part series that teaches our EL and gen ed teachers how to be co-teachers with built-in planning time to support students staying in core instruction. 
Being an English language learner is an asset. It's something to be celebrated, to be multilingual. We have kids who are quadrilingual in our district, and that's something to be, to be celebrated, and it's not, and the more access to instruction for the typical, not our LTL kids, but the more access to core instruction they have, the more opportunity they have to exceed the performance of their non-ELL counterparts. Um, as we think about uh, program supports, just like with Safety Net, we offer a summer program for ELs, and what we, it's, it's really fun because we get to use the science curriculum to teach academic language, academic science language. So our students will grow um, seeds and write about it, read about it, talk about it in a way that's really hands-on and applicable. Um, and typically the kids that we queue into our summer program are students who continue to, who are emerging, so have come into our system and um, maybe recently qualified or are um, continuing to struggle with uh, English language as it's presented typically during the school day. So, 3,007 students as of this morning. Is Barbara here still? Yay, Barbara, 3,000 kids. So Barbara and I always talk about the, the EL population increase. So, and out of those 3,007 um, students, yes, Chris. Sorry, I, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around the fact that one in 10 of our kids is ELL currently. What fraction of our kids have been in ELL at some point? We, so we track kids who have exited ELL for four years, and there are another 3,000 kids in that group. So, so 6,000 yeah. students either currently in or exited ELs. Yeah. Quick question, um, and I wondered this earlier to be quite frank uh, with the low income students that were uh, given the opportunity to have uh, the summer program. I, and I recall that the summer program basically is just July, it give or take. Is. It's uh, four weeks. You're right, it's days. the middle of the summer and you've got in a month out. Um, is that enough for the ELL students to do? I know that some students, uh, special needs students, have a drop off. Right. And I didn't, uh, I don't know if that has an application to all students related. To me, that one month in the middle kind of is it's a booster, but it's, sometimes I don't know if it carries through to the fall. And what we found, Tim and I, I asked Mr. Krieger here, so what, show me my summer programs work. And so we took a control group of students with similar, with like data profiles who didn't attend summer school and a group of students who did attend. And we found the students who attended summer school didn't have a slide, whereas kids with the same, in that same, no. Control group. I understand what you're saying, the ones that didn't have it. I'm even wondering if the ones who did have it just for the four weeks in the middle, if there is still, because you have another gap, uh, I would think that, to be quite frank, you'd have a, a learning curve in the first week of summer school, then you'd have a drop off after that first or second week of uh, non summer school. So that's why I'm asking mm -hmm. is the middle enough? Yeah, and I think that we can continually ask that question like, how much? Because we know the longer kids are receiving the appropriate intervention, mm -hmm. the better they'll be. That's so we, at, yeah. we see that kids maintain. We, they don't, we're not closing the gap over the summer okay, that's for, for this mm -hmm. subgroup of kids. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is that, yeah, okay. So if, as, if we think about our annual assessment of EL students, they're tested annually um, from the middle of February through March on reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And so we get the results back towards the end of the school year typically, and it's an online, primarily an online assessment. And the students who, there's some paper pencil assessments for kindergarten and first grade students. And so as we look at um, the, our exit rates, we anticipated between the WELPA and the ELPA, because WELPA was scored by, was hand scored, that we would see a more significant drop in our kids. And as you can see from the data, we had a little dip when the ELPA 21 came in, but then we're continuing up on the, the trajectory of the ex, number of exited, or the percentage of students exited. 
So as we look at our enrollment this fall, we, you can see the preponderance of students are in kindergarten. And then as we move through the system, there are fewer and fewer students per grade level. I thought you might find it interesting that this year at Rush Elementary, they have 191 EL students that are currently in program that is not inclusive of their exited students. Um, Redmond L has 144 EL, continue, like continuing EL program. Kamiakin Middle, Rose Hill Middle, and Redmond Middle average around 60 students each. And our Redmond Middle, Lake Washington, Redmond High, Lake Washington, and Juanita are between 80 and 90 students continuing in program. So it's, this is, I guess, the opportunity to talk about our students. You'll notice the numbers drop pretty dramatically throughout the years in our school district. And this, is, this follows pretty much a national trend in EL performance. And what we find is that if, we, if kids aren't exiting ELL within the first four to five years that they have been enrolled in our system, that there are different interventions that need to come into play. And we categorize that group of students as long-term English learners. So for we, it's, like nationally, it's five years in ELL. For the purposes of ours, we're looking at kids who have been in ELL for four years. And we put systems in place and are looking at what curricular tools and differences in their instructional approach do we need to have. Chris, and Quick Mark. question, of those uh, elementary schools that you mentioned, uh, which seem to be very astronomical numbers, it's, out of how many? Oh my goodness. So it's, it's basically, it, it, <laughs> right. sound, it looks like about 20 to 30 percent at the top of my head. I think when I looked at it earlier and it was just through glancing through slides, they were at about 500-esque. Um, this year at, I know this year at Rush Elementary, she has five kindergarten classes. And out of the kindergarten, there's over 100 plus students in those five classrooms that are English learners. Yeah, I'm still just agog. We've got about 2,600, 2,700 kids per class. Literally one third of our kindergartners are in ELL. I, 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 Eric, you look very happy with yourself for knowing this number. Because <laughs> the census has shown that actually that we have about a third foreign born within our cities. So it aligns that that would be expected, that a third of our population would be that way. That makes looking at a flat achievement line in some ways remarkable if you look at the trajectory of our ELL numbers as well. Not that that makes us complacent, but it is an interesting factor to consider. In those, in those elementary, the large group, uh, and since we have so many languages, as you pointed out, that are spoken, is there a preponderance when, they, uh, when you're coming into kindergarten? Is it a higher number of one language over another that dominates, or is it a real It spread? matches the, the demographic the of the district. It matches the rest of the school. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I was And wondering. I think what's important to, to share with you about our EL programs is we have a differentiated approach depending on what level of English learner they are and where their gaps are, if it's reading, writing, listening, or speaking. So we know that writing is the last skill, essentially, to come along when you're learning a new language. And so our students who are emerging, no matter what grade level they're on, we expect them to have some form of explicit direct instruction from the EL teacher that is connected to what is going on in core instruction. For our students who are progressing, and there are and so within the, the data profile of each child, it will give you a score of one, two, five on how they scored in reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And what we look at is how the EL teacher, we ask the question, is this child performing on the SBA or on our, gr our grade data or on DIBBLES? And if they are the best place for that student is in core instruction. So we're working to get the entire district um, psyopized, if we like add, make it into a, a verb, um, to learn the skills and strategies to meet the needs of ELs. And this year we're focusing on lesson preparation, background knowledge, and making um, content comprehensible. So as we think about 
um, all of our teachers, because we've gone from a district where we had 800 students in 2010 in ELL, and we've, more, we've tripled, more than tripled it. And so we think in schools where there were maybe a few EL students, we now have 20% of every class is either EL or exited EL. Okay. And you saw a version of this chart around what happens when our EL students exit compared to non-EL for all students. We have the opportunity to collaborate with Bellevue School District and North Shore School District on a Native American, Alaska Native program. Mary Wilbur is our liaison. She is the most amazing individual. She, uh, every Monday night, and I would encourage you to attend at, at any Monday night, if you wish, at Lake Washington High School. And families, Native American, Alaska Native families, who have joined our program come from all three districts and participate in, we have a before, before program group that is looking at students who are Native American, Alaska Native in K-5, who are not standard in reading. And we, put, we are u utilizing an online adaptive technology that is Lexia. And so we've trained some of the elders in the, um, in, the, in the local tribes and Mary Wilbur on administering that program for a half an hour every, every Monday and then giving parents access to that information, um, access to the tool for students over the course of the rest of the week. Uh, you, will, you will see students, the, the most moving portion part of um, this program is having Native American students living in an urban area who are deeply connected to their Native American roots. And that happens as a result of Mary's championing of our Native American Alaska Native program in conjunction with our um, friends at um, the Snoqualmie tribe where we are working collaboratively with them to ensure we're giving our students um, access to their culture within, yeah. Is there a, uh, among the uh, Native American nations and the Native, Alaskan Native population, is there one nation in particular that dominates uh, out here? I mean, I'm sorry, I grew up with the Plains uh, Nation, sure. so I don't know up here. Is there yeah. one more than another? Is, is it Suquamish or what? What we find, uh, there's a variety of tribes mm -hmm. represented. Yeah, I noticed that at the meeting that I, or the, the graduation thing that I went to. Yes. So, so that, what you see at the, at the Native graduation is representative of um, the tribes, the tribal affiliation in general for the different groups. No, one, not one dominant. And you, guys, you may be asking, like, well, why do we partner with Snoqualmie if that's, oh, okay. I would tell you because they just do. We're on, um, <laughs> Snoqualmie tribal land, and they're the tribe that's closest to us. So, sorry, I answered a question you didn't ask. So then we look at our Title I programs. As you may know, Title I has, uh, we've gone from two years ago, a $1.8 million budget, to this year barely eking at $700,000 budget. So with, as you know, Title I is generated in a, by a percentage of students living in poverty. So we have, I can pull the data on kid by kid, students at all of our schools, not, kid, not nameable, but numbers, kid by kid at, um, at each school, how many students there are. And what we find is the, the end, the total number of students hasn't changed, but as our population increases, the percentage decreases. And so, and, the, uh, and also, yeah, go ahead. No, no, okay. Um, so we've gone from five Title I schools to then four to three, and this year we have two Title I schools. Because as we think about the building a program that will, we can see measurable, measurable results for kids, and then looking at, they used to be if a student, if the population of a school was 40% or higher, they could apply for school-wide. Fortunately, both of these schools were 40% a few years ago, and now one is in the upper, thir the mid 30s, and the other is in the high 28, 28, 29%. You mentioned that the growth of the district was diminishing the percentage, but has it diminished the numbers of 
No, we, okay, we that, still have that's this. Why, that's why I was wanting to make yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So Do, does we, this make a case for us trying to uh, talk to our federal representatives to change that percentage uh, break off point for Title I schools? Yeah, or even talking about how do we, although perhaps moving away from percentage to mm -hmm. total number of students. Okay. And um, although after you name the percentage and you discuss how you're qualifying students, it generates a per pupil allocation, but it's kind of a misnomer based on the number of schools you're serving in Title and what's the scope of the work of Title I. Also another question too, because of the affluence of the area, uh, making it more difficult for lower income but yet not Title I perhaps uh, income. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a case to be made for the fact that we have a lot of kids that are being missed because they're not necessarily Title I but they're Title I and a half if you will. <laughs> I wouldn't say being missed because we... Well, I mean missed and the no, dollars being it, able to be oh, uh, given. Oh, right. Well, what we do is we're fortunate to have a generous school district where our district is unique to many and that, you, that as a district, we locally, um, through levy money, fund our safety net, our, our, most of our K-12 safety net. So we're not contingent on grants specifically for at least our six through 12, the district provides us with resources to you to do that. That's something that we need to point out to the legislators then too, the importance of the levies and how they make up for the uh, uh, dollars that are not granted federally for uh, low income, especially when low income varies in a district such as ours. Mm -hmm. The cost yeah. of living, exactly, that's what I was getting to, the idea that 20,000 yeah. in one district does not mean 20,000 in another. And what's fortunate also is we have a, a, bucket, a funding bucket of money that we use to take this, the schools that have the highest number of free and reduced students and allocate, come in behind. You, they're not getting Title I, but we're going to um, support the program with more FTE. With It used to be called Better Schools Monies, and so that comes behind and fills in some of the gaps. So what we see, I, and I know that the, the data gap around, uh, the gap in performance of um, all students and the subgroup of low income it was evident in our presentation earlier tonight. What I would like to say is we see gap closing or maintaining, right, in our essentially closing when you think about going from 63 to 70. I, I'm not sure how statistical um, six points or seven points is in uh, when we're looking at percentage growth and I would. It beats one. It what? It beats one. All right. That's my goal. One percent or greater. Okay. So as we think about, I know it's kind of it's interesting that our low income students in title schools outperform the state and in both ELA and math. What is really important for you to know about our title schools is we have more resources in those schools to support our students and our teachers. We know that you need to do things with intention and make explicit decisions based on student data to support students. And sometimes that is in the way of supporting teachers and learning best practice strategies for teaching foundational literacy, for teaching math skills. And so the gap, although the, the closing, the, the narrowing of the gap can be attributed to a long list of intentional practices in our title schools. So um, I just wanted to try and clarify, this is all students at these schools? This is uh, following, following a cohort of students yeah. from third, fourth to fifth grade. The, the reason I ask is mm -hmm. that um, I, if you look at either of these, mm -hmm. it's nice to see that relative to the state, the title schools are pulling away. Mm -hmm. And relative to our non-title schools, they're closing. Mm -hmm. um, both of those are trends that I can get behind. Okay. The challenge for me is mm -hmm. figuring out, is that trend attributable to we're doing a better job with the low-income students who are receiving supports, 
or is the trend for the building because there are fewer low-income students? Mm -hmm. So and, this is definitely mm -hmm. something I'd like to see it broken out both ways. Mm -hmm. And I would say at these particular schools, these are those, this is the Title I schools students who've been there for three consecutive years, which is the largest number of um, students living in poverty. Oh, and yeah. I think the data we would we see at schools that have, you know, an N of 15 students in poverty, K5, in our ele other elementary schools, the data might look differently because we're because of the intentional supports right for the and, title and one schools get. actually what i was getting at is muir i've always kept some focus on muir and yeah. seeing muir drop from over 40 percent at one point it was close to 50 percent uh free and reduced now it's down to closer to 30. Right. Um, it could be closing the gap between that school and another school simply because there are fewer kids on free and reduced watch mm -hmm. um so the 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 breakout of the data that would be very informative to me isn't, mm -hmm. I love the cohort approach, mm -hmm. but the cohorts would be at any time point has a kid been on free and reduced lunch, that is our low income students. Mm -hmm. And if kids mm -hmm. have never been on free and reduced lunch, that's mm -hmm. the comparison cohort that I'd be interested sure. in seeing here, so. Yeah, and my team and I spend a lot of time bothering Mr. Krieger for help us look at the data this way. And so I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share intervention programs. Yeah. If we go back to that last slide, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, to Chris's point, it seems that perhaps that a lot of the uh, uh, Title I kids and their families are basically being squeezed out of the district when you get down to it because of the price, of, whether it's rent or whatever it be, mm -hmm. uh, available facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that we outperform the state, I think that again speaks to the uh, the funding we get through our levies, and a lot of the uh, districts in the state have no chance of getting those kind of levy dollars. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we can support ours supports the idea that we can make these adjustments to kids that need them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that we definitely, although they don't receive, some schools don't receive Title I monies, we really look at data holistically. And when decisions have to be made on cutoffs on who we serve. Uh, it ends up we prioritize K-3 literacy because we know if we can get students reading by third grade that they will transition out of second grade into third grade reading to learn instead of learning to read, which is our primary focus. I have a question for you. Okay. You had mentioned that the long-term language learners mm -hmm. We're classified at five years. We do it at four years. Mm -hmm. Has there been looking at, if, what if you just went earlier? I mean, I was thinking, looking at that cohort, you can see that drop pretty quick. Mm -hmm. What if you intervened earlier before it got, why and, wait till four, I guess is my right. question. And what we find is we are, we're not just saying, oh, do your best. We're intervening through safety net supports and continuous supports in EL. And I think what we really need to do is be evaluating specific skills and strategies at each level of our organization and what do we need to put in place to support our LTLs. And part of that is our work around sheltered instruction observation protocol that we're um, branching out to train the whole district on. And it, it really is looking at getting granular with the data to see if, we are there, if there are conclusions we can make about um, demographic subgroups of students um, and location in the district do we see. I can make some generalizations now, but I, would, I wouldn't want to do that without my data chart in front of me. Absolutely understood. <laughs> um, the other piece that's interesting, you speak to the Title I and the shifting of the percentages and that and mm -hmm. the funding. How do you, and you mentioned this, that the levy dollars help to do that, mm -hmm. to help fill that in. Mm -hmm. if, if we are seeing such good gains, or at mm -hmm. least seeing a, a consistent pattern for this, how do we look at being able to support that in all our schools, even where there are only 15 kids? Um, right. Because I just know I've talked about, and I've heard from others, it's those pockets. It's sometimes it's much harder to be in poverty in an affluent area. Right. Because there's not the access to the services that you need in different environments. Mm -hmm. And so how do, what is it that we need to do to help support that mm -hmm. to make that happen? 
Yeah, and prior to me coming up here, Mike and I were talking about, oh, we have so many ideas on how to generalize some of the supports we're given. So through, and I'm going into probably another presentation that we all at, around our MTSS work and thinking about to schools that have volunteered to work with us closely and collaboratively around MTSS. We're putting similar systems in place that we have at our title schools during the pilot to see if those approaches are, can be generalized and show the same gains as, um, as we're seeing in our title schools, which includes work with teachers on what does the data tell you, how can you winnow down a student's performance to an explicit skill gap instead of a generalized gap, and so really working on how does data inform your instruction across interventions, safety, um, EL, and core instruction. So more to come on that. All right. Thank you. Just okay. wanted to see how we support that good work that's yeah. happening. Okay. Any other questions? I just want to say thank you, thank you. on behalf of the board and, and myself for all the work that you do. Um, it is always fun to see, having been able to see the Native American program, it is impressive what they do. Um, and all your work with the L, it's always been fun to see the shifts. Mm -hmm. How many years has it been that you've been? In this role, I'm going into year seven. Yeah, so it has taken a while to start to see all these. Well, and I think that um, in around 2013, uh, the federal government came out with a Dear Colleague letter that helped for our EL students oh. that really helped us have those conversations with general education teachers and with our EL staff on pull-out model is not the best strategy. And so being able to evolve from, okay, not pulling out all kids, send me your schedule, you know, and it's just that helping people grow to do what's best for kids because every teacher gives their heart and soul for our kids and helping them make scheduling adjustments that support the students is really important. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks guys. Okay, so now we're moving on to the superintendent report this evening. And tonight we have a report on nutrition services, and so I'll ask Barbara to come up, and Darren Helfrecht, who is our Sodexo fearless leader, supplies us with those cookies that nobody can forget. <laughs> Me. Sorry, right there. Just used to it at the bottom. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. Okay, well, I'm pleased to present uh, the report tonight on nutrition services. Uh, tonight, uh, you will see a focus on quality. Uh, our quality K-12 program, healthy choices, student engagement, and staff development. Uh, we, uh, Sodexo, has been our proud partner for over uh, 37 years. Uh, we uh, contract with them to provide our nutrition services program. We are required to rebid the contract every five years, and it is monitored by OSPI. Um, Sodexo has been the successful bidder each time. So we're very proud of that longstanding partnership. Um, I'm going to turn this uh, presentation over. I want to introduce Darren Helfrecht. He is our uh, Director of Nutrition Services, and he's going to share with you his passion about nutrition services. Thank you, Barbara. So Barbara always says passion because she wants me to make sure I keep it short because she knows I can talk all night about nutrition services. Um, thank you very much for having me. This is uh, my fourth, going my fourth year here. Uh, fourth presentation uh, in front of the board. And it, it really is an honor to be here. It's one of our uh, marquee accounts for Sodexo. And so it's just fun to, to know that, that you've got a, a great, we've got a great program, doing a lot of fantastic things and just in a, a fantastic district here at Lake Washington. And so when we really talk about our mission, we think about uh, making sure every student's future ready. And so we talk with our staff about how do, you know, how do we play into that? You know, what do we do? And that's really, it's, you know, being able, to, it's being able to offer access to nutritious meals, allowing every student the opportunity to succeed. Because we really know it's, that's what takes, you know, that 
that if they're worrying about being hungry, um, you know, where, where's the next meal come from, or, or I didn't get a chance to have breakfast, or I don't have time for lunch today, we have that opportunity for, you, for them there. So when we look at our goals, we break it down. One of the things that you know, is very important is our wellness policy. This is a uh, USDA mandated program, but it also helps us guide making sure what we're doing through uh, PE classes, uh, you know, health, the nutrition is, is all acting together. And so we, as we note up here, students who have nutritious food are better prepared to learn. Uh, we also comply with both the state and federal nutrition standards and guidelines, and that's your national school breakfast and lunch programs. I'll talk a little bit more about that. We also uh, serve meals that include a variety of foods. So really, how do, when we look at our, our uh, population, it's very diverse. And so how do we you know, be able to find in our menus to find different things to have kids try? So it's a, kind of a uh, multicultural. Uh, we're really seeing our dynamics change within the industry because we're coming from um, uh, interracial marriages now to having blended families where kids that are, you know, that are growing up uh, used to having what we call pho rito, which is the pho in a burrito. And so there's finding things like that, and that's really what makes my job fun, is, is how do we, we've been an innovative, find variety of foods, and then also uh, helping those students, you know, promoting, making good nutritious choices. So when you look at the breakfast and lunch program, it is a federally funded program. Uh, it is, it's managed by the USDA, and we saw the, the biggest changes in the industry in 2010 with the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act, and that's what really changed our regulations, looked at not only uh, what we serve in both our breakfast and lunch programs, but also those different snack items that are available, uh, also regulates um, uh, school parties, you know, classroom parties, those different things, and, and so it's very comprehensive. Uh, we've really seen the industry change uh, a lot from the, the manufacturers by bringing in more, you know, creating better whole grain products, uh, reduced fat, those things. When it first, when the change was first happened, the industry was not there, and we're really seeing now a lot of quality products uh, that kids really enjoy. And then from a, a locally, the OSPI oversees our program, um, and then uh, when you look at our compliance standards, we are uh, inspected by the health department twice a year, both in the fall and the spring. And so we get that same, same grade uh, that any restaurant or uh, food establishment would have. Uh, we also do an annual safety inspection that's uh, conducted by independent third party. That's called EqualSure. This is something that Sodexo pays for, uh, has a uh, independent third party come in and really do a comprehensive audit, surprise audit, in the sense that we, we don't know until the day they show up which sites they're gonna go to, and they look at both at food and physical safety. Uh, we also do administrative review that's conducted by OSPI every three years. Uh, we've got one more year, next year, uh, the 1920 school year, uh, we'll be due for that review again. And then we also uh, have the, the federal state audits conducted by the state auditor's office. Uh, every, about every other year, they'll, they'll look at uh, nutrition services from an audit standpoint, same thing that the rest of the district goes through. When you look at our revenue source for the 2017-18 uh, uh, school year, uh, we generated about eight, it was just a little over $8.8 .8 million. And as we've talked a lot about tonight, you've heard about the uh, very affluent community. Uh, really, the majority of our uh, revenue comes from uh, the, the fees that we charge, the, the meal prices. And that's really, you know, there's, uh, that's, in this district, the biggest challenge we have is kids have multiple choices. And so we really are focused on not only meeting the needs and, and offering something there for everyone, but also things that, that are going to encourage kids. So very, uh, you know, like having, um, we've been doing um, organic spring mix on Wednesdays, local, pro, uh, local produce highlighting, things like that. Different things that, that can encourage kids, but also help bring them, you know, from the cold lunch, the, the lunch they bring at home, wanting to buy. Uh, we also see uh, another 20, uh, a little over 20% of our funding comes from both state and federal, uh, and then our commodity program is about 6% breaks up our, that makes up our revenue stream. Last year, we looked at, uh, this, this graph here shows you a comparison of our breakfast served. Uh, we saw an increase of about 2% in our breakfast last year. 
Uh, we also, um, we, we were fairly flat on our lunches served. One of the things we had is a price increase last year. So we know that always, uh, that's 25 cent in the beginning of the year, that's where we usually see a downturn of that and then we build that back over. That's pretty common. Uh, then our a la carte dollars, what we see in, in our district is, especially in our secondaries, it's very fast paced, kids wanna grab and go and that's where we package a lot of our meals in, in a la carte where they can grab and go. Again, still following the same USDA standards. So but that's the nuts and bolts of the program. So really getting into the fun part is really our, our program focus. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the breakfast program, uh, also about staff development. How do we make sure that we're really producing quality uh, food and also being able to uh, create student engagement? The breakfast program, it's very, very exciting because I think it's really a growing opportunity. And Barbara asked me, is this actually a picture of an omelet that you can get at school? And yes, that's our uh, made to order, uh, made to order omelet bars. We, at our uh, high schools, we do every Wednesday and Friday. Uh, we also do it in our middle schools. And it is, it's kids come up, pick their toppings, and there is an omelet that's created right there. Uh, we've also doing like French toast bar where they can come up and have the whole grain, whole grain French toast and then uh, build, uh, build uh, from that what they want on top of that. And then we also do the grab and go. Again, fast paced, kids wanna be able to get out, uh, grab something and then get out with the, their friends. Uh, this past, um, it was two years ago, we started really looking at our elementary breakfast at breakfast after the bell. Typically our, our traditional breakfast, which is that before school, kids come in, have their, and then bell time and they go to class. Uh, we've seen that it's, it's been kind of a mediocre participation. Uh, we deal with challenges of the, um, bus schedules, getting kids there in time, um, you know, kids walking, you know, getting to school there in time, uh, wanting to spend time with their friends, whether maybe they're out on the playground, that kind of thing. And then uh, also the stigma. Uh, a lot of times uh, the traditional breakfast has that stigma that it's a free and reduced program. And so we started at Dixon two, two years ago in the spring. We actually started an a, a after the bell program and those have been really very successful for us. Uh, we now have four of our, our programs, uh, including Barton, which came on this year, uh, Claire Barton Elementary, the new school, is a, is a uh, after the bell. And what we do, really with that, we see uh, probably about a 20% increase in our breakfast participation at those schools. But even that's, uh, I think it's, it's even more exciting is the look at the number of paid kids that actually participate in that. We actually have seen this year about 150% growth uh, over the traditional uh, with the paid kids. And a thing what, why that's so important is because it goes back to that stigma that I talked about. By having it something fun that all the kids are participating in, you, you, you move away from that stigma of it's a free and reduced program. So we're really, uh, with any of our future programs um, with breakfast as we bring district or bring uh, schools on, we really wanna make sure it's after the bell because that's where we have the most success and we're, we're getting the, the opportunity for kids to participate. When we look at program uh, focus on staff, staff development, again, this is very key. Uh, as most businesses in, the, in this region, every, everybody's struggling with labor. And we've always been that, always trying to, to find good quality people uh, to be able to support. And it, and it can be a, a tough job. It's very fast paced, it can be hot. Uh, it, you know, it can, uh, you got kids coming at you. You figure we, we served uh, a little over 2.5 million meals in 180 days last year. That's a lot of kids coming at you. And, and uh, uh, our traditional ways that we used to look for, for help uh, through newsletters, up on our menus, that kind of thing, it's really it's, it's not been successful the last couple of years. So we changed our whole philosophy. We actually hired a full-time uh, hourly recruiter that is out there working not only our traditional job boards, uh, you know, peach jar, things like that, but also she's a, a member in the community. Uh, she has kids that go to Alcott and Evergreen, and she's worked with different uh, organizations, you know, getting in front of groups uh, that part of the Facebook groups that she's in, uh, in person. Uh, she's also reaching out to uh, the, the colleges like uh, um, Bellevue College, Lake Washington Institute to really be able to find um, good candidates that, that we can bring in. And uh, we've actually have several chefs on staff now. Um, and that's where we, you know, 
once we get them in, then we really want to make sure we're training them well. And so if you look at the Chef Book, book Camp, which you might think it's a, a typo, but it's actually a uh, play on words because we want it by the book. And so our executive chef is there. We, uh, any of our new hires now, we started this last spring, any of our new hires are going through a minimum of, of 10 hours of training in a kitchen before we place them out into a, a, an open position uh, where we can fill them in. And so what this is really helping us with, one, from a safety standpoint, that we're making sure our food safety, taking temps, temp logs, all those types of things, but then also what makes up a, uh, you know, a reimbursable meal, um, how, to, how to use equipment in the kitchen. It's very different. A lot of times we're, we're uh, hiring stay-at-home parents and they might be used to just their normal stove and, and uh, have a convection, double back convection oven or a combi oven, which we have in some of our, our uh, secondaries. How to use that, pro those types of equipment is what we do training on. And then we also, uh, you know, once we've got them hired, trained, and then retention, really focus on team recognition of how do we, we celebrate our staff and, and how do we make it fun for them. So all of that training really leads to that food quality. And so these are just some pictures of things that, that we're doing uh, to, with our food quality. We've done a lot with our garden bars, uh, really, um, focusing on fresh fruit and vegetables. The USDA Commodity Program, which I talked about earlier, there's a DOD, which is Department of Defense, actually provides us access to uh, fresh fruit and vegetables, which are uh, grown in the US, uh, a lot of local stuff. And so that's where we do our local Wednesday. We will also have a lot of berries, a lot of, uh, in the wintertime, we get a lot of squash and, and uh, potatoes, that kind of thing. Um, but we're, uh, we're really focused on that. And then also, um, the really, the, how we're pre, uh, presentation, kids want to see the food being made in front of them. They want to be able to customize it. And those are key things that we focus on. Then when it gets down to student engagement, it's time to celebrate. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm big on themes, um, dressing up in costumes. I've been a minion. I've been a cowboy. I've, uh, you know, I've done all the things to get out there and, and really build that. Uh, making making it fun and re reason we call it time to celebrate because we really are celebrating lunchtime or, or mealtime where where kids can come together we celebrate diversity because we have different uh, different cultures that will feature those kinds of things but it's really about how do we make that lunchroom a fun opportunity for kids uh, one of the ones we, we started last uh, year was Western Days, and we did last spring. Uh, we used to have in the past, each of uh, the elementaries would sign up for a barbecue. Uh, typically, we would do about nine or ten elementaries a barbecue at that, and a lot of times they overlapped. It was difficult to cover it. And so what we, we did this uh, past spring is we actually ske scheduled a uh, barbecue at every elementary uh, one, uh, f three days a week. So there was a, a different one those three days. And what that allowed us to do is it really allowed us as a team to go out there and fully support that, the help with that. And you'll see some of the uh, pictures of costumes and, and uh, things to go out there. And, and that's, uh, if you look on the picture on the top left, that's uh, pros uh, Prospector Pete. And that is Cowboy Shorty and our horse Tater Tot. And uh, kids, it's just unbelievable the smiles and, and the fun that the kids had with it. And um, it's just, a, it's a really great time. And it, it allowed us to get all, all 27 elementaries versus the nine or 10 we, we were doing before. Another uh, great program that we have a student engage, for student engagement is our Future Chef. Each year, Sodexo does a, uh, a nationwide uh, chef competition. And ours is, we, it's always in the spring. Uh, right now we've got it tentatively scheduled for March 6th. Uh, we have fourth and fifth graders. We split the district up one year. Uh, it's, um, you know, there's like 14 schools and then next year it'll be 15 schools uh, with the two new ones. But we, we have fourth and fifth graders and they submit their recipes based around a theme. And they actually come in and prepare a meal. And, and Barbara's had the, the pleasure of being a judge um, pretty much every year. Uh, and it's, it's amazing to see what the kids can do. We have a mentor with, that works with them, making sure that they're doing safety and helping them keep them on time. But it's really those fourth and fifth graders coming in. And it's just, uh, like I said, it's just incredible. Um, uh, it'll be March 6th this year. And encourage any of you, if you want to see a fun event, 
Uh, it is really, really cool to see these kids get excited about it. But again, it encourages them to create ideas. And uh, we always find one or two ideas that we can actually implement in our program and get on our menu uh, each year. Some of the other things with student engagement is our Try It Tuesday. Tomorrow, if you're out, you can, uh, you'll be able to try uh, a sweet pea guacamole. And again, it's, a, it's just a variation on a recipe. The idea is to get kids to try different things. Uh, last month we had a, it was a sweet chili watermen, watermelon salad. And it's just samples that they can take a little and just try it. It's really Try It Tuesday. Uh, as I've talked about before, Local Wednesday, that's where we focus, we, we uh, feature our organic spring mix, any organic products we can, but also then really what can we do locally kind of in the, in the uh, greater Northwest, pull from our local farmers and feature on that. Then we also, with our, our menu, uh, we really, at all three levels, the high school, middle school, and elementary, we keep a theme day. So Monday's Asian, Tuesday's International, Wednesday All-American, Thursday our local favorites, and Friday's Italian Day. And so that helps uh, families plan. Uh, you know, if it's uh, Italian night, you might not want to go out and take family out on, on, for Italian on Friday, um, those kinds of things. But it helps us keep consistent across all different levels, too. So we, ser we serve variations of, of really the same items. So if you look at that, our, our best part of the day is really the kids and the smiles. I mean, that's what my job's all about. It's like creating fun. Uh, really making uh, the food, uh, you know, something that uh, everybody loves to eat, at least I do. And so this is a perfect job for me. And I will highlight that little, the, the picture down in the, the left. This is a note last year when we did the, uh, uh, our um, lunchroom hero day. Uh, we, all, we had a lot of the kids that submitted, you know, thank you notes or you're a superhero, those kinds of things to our, our nutrition services staff. And this is one, um, thank you for all your services these past years. It is appreciated by feeding students. They are better prepared for the day. Really sums up why we're here, what we do, and, and uh, you know, what, how we get rewarded. And with that, thank you. Thank you. So are there any, that we do, Director Sage. I just have a quick question. Do you ever cater espresso carts? Do we cater espresso carts? Yes, can you, can you offer an espresso stand anywhere? Okay. Um, we've looked at it. Um, there are some restrictions of what we can do as far as the nutritional. Uh, the biggest challenge we have is the, the equipment. Um, I've got uh, one of my uh, managers has been chomping on me for a food cart, or I mean a food truck. Mm -hmm. And I keep going, you tell me what the return of investment <laughs> is on 180 days. Uh, you know, and that's our biggest challenge, right? Because we, you know, we don't do a lot in the summer other than with some of the Title I, um, uh, WANIC, those, those programs. But the espresso um, is, is a great, if, but it's the investment in the equipment that we're looking at. How about a coffee cart? We're talking adults now. I should have prefaced this. I'm not yeah. going to give it to kindergartners. No, no, <laughs> and we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to do that. They, they got enough energy. Uh, I know my eight-year-old does not need any kind of caffeine. I don't um, even need it. So I, I think we've, we're looking at right now that uh, uh, both the cold brew is really popular, and Stoke has a, is a great program um, that we're looking at that is, is a black. Uh, it's, just, it's just plain coffee, so it's not, it's not sweetened. Uh, we also... Um, we, we have cure eggs, that kind of thing. So we can do, do things with, with coffee. Um, it's just trying to find the right venue where we'd want to offer it at. Okay, we'll talk, thank you. Okay, I would love to. Always looking for new ideas. <laughs> coffee. Um, I, I, you just showed me 19 slides without a graph. Um, I'm, I'm in withdrawal, I'm hungry I for data. I had one, um, a pie chart. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, how do we measure success in promoting nutritious choices? I mean, how do we tell that what we're trying to do is actually having an impact? And I'm, I'm not asking you to make an impact on all children, because some of them are gonna be like my sons, where they're not willing to eat anything that is new. But how do we measure that we're actually, what we're trying to do is, is, is happening? I think one of the things that we really look at is what we're offering. Uh, and by being, I mean, the, the thing is, is that a lot of times people look at our program, you know, take pizza for example, a lot of times people will look at that, it's, it's not nutritious. But it's, it's not the pizza that you get at Pizza Hut. It is a reformulated product, it has the whole grain uh, crust to it, it has low fat skim milk cheese, 
Um, and it's actually, when you look at it based next to a, sam a deli sandwich, a sandwich from home, the, you know, the nitrates and stuff that can be in deli meat, the sodium, those kinds of things, pizza really stacks up well. So I think that's one where it starts is, is that we really are focusing on the product that we put out. Uh, the product, the fresh, uh, there's, you know, you can do a lot of processed things in the more fresh that we can have, and that's why using DOD, so getting those kids to take take things. And so I think that's where we really see, you know, it's, it's awesome. I, I was just out at Man last week, and it was amazing to see the plates that the kids and the, the different colors that they're taking. And I think that's where, you know, the focus is that driving the sales is, is a big measure for us. Uh, because of, of how much fresh fruits and things that we can offer and then how the, the products that we're doing, how can we incorporate more from scratch type of things are in, in building in from the regulations. Because remember, this the regulations really dictates that we have to be better at the nutritional value of our meals. A couple of things. Um, you mentioned the, the stigma that goes along with the, the breakfast uh, menu or the breakfast offering. And I'm wondering, perhaps, especially now that it's after the bell and you're getting a increase in the kids that are paying actually for the meal, have you, is there a thought to marketing to the kids with two working parents, the idea there is a schedule problem, not a desire problem? Yeah. And maybe marketing to uh, parents saying, look, if, uh, don't worry if your, your schedule is just a bear in the morning, we can help take care of your kids. Uh, it's just a thought of the marketing approach to it. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, mention, having been inside our s schools a lot for the last six or seven years with my son, uh, I've noticed the quality of the staff, and they're, they're tremendous. My favorite, though, was the sandwich lady that, uh, as I went up one day, she said, it's my salami boy, and he, because he asked for salami every day, and I said, do you mention that as the first choice? She said, well, yeah. I said, he always takes the first choice you offer. For, so that, from there on, she would vary so the offering yeah. Yeah. as to what she offered first. Uh, but it was just, about, I, I never thought of it. Yeah. Uh, and third, um, I know this has been a tr uh, problem in the past to try and be able to do it or not, and I don't know if the regulations have changed any for you, but I know we've been able to change it in the evenings, uh, the giving of uh, excess food after, the, uh, after school to uh, shelters. Are you, being able, are you being able to do that better now, or is, are the regulations allowing you to do it better now is what I guess I should yeah, say. Yeah, so I think it's really been how do we get, so let, let me go back, Mark, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll answer your, your first yeah. three. And so uh, from the breakfast program, we, we definitely market it better. We use uh, Peach Jar, um, you know, newsletter, those kinds of things to get that. And again, we, we just, it's just any time we go from breakfast, uh, the traditional before school, to after the bell, we, we really see that. So that's that's our focus, that's that's key, how do we do it? Because the time is there. And it's it really doesn't take up instructional time because uh, it's that, it's, kids are very quick with it. And again, it's, you know, like for my son, I'll, he'll eat it at home, he's eating at, you know, 6, 7, 6, 30, 7 o'clock in the morning, and then he's not eating, he's in Issaquah, but he doesn't eat then again until noon. And so um, I can, you know, as a parent, I make sure he's, he's really eating a lot. But I, I think if I had, he had the opportunity to have breakfast at school, it would be a great alternative because it's that every couple of hours he's getting something. And so uh, I think that's where we can do that more after the bell. It offers those families not only opportunity, if I am pushed, but also for a kid that, that is still hungry. Um, then the second item we had is with our staff, incredible, incredible set of uh, folks. Uh, they're just absolutely amazing what what they do to uh, and how much they care, how much they care about the kids and that. And you know, it's it's those that's where sometimes we see it, uh, you know, folks that don't stick around and it's just not the right thing for them. But we do have folks that are 20. Uh, I just had a gal that celebrated her 35th year. Uh, we have people working in their 70s or 80s. Uh, because they just love being there with the kid, even if it's just a couple hours a day, because it's a fun environment. And then your They're last right. question was, my mind. Um, uh, the last question was on the, the left over, the ability yeah. to give it to uh, it, shelters. So um, one of the things that we do is, is really from a safety standpoint, anything, once it leaves from the kitchen, we will not allow it to come back into the kitchen. And so there is an organization that's doing a lot of work with uh, capturing the share tables. And the reason we don't want, because then we, we can't, uh, 
ensure that there isn't cross-contamination when it comes in, if the product's been handled, that comes in and, you know, uh, a, a, any sanitation thing like that, if it hits it, it really, really hurt, triples a program, ask Chipotle. Uh, they've really experienced it. And so that's, that's key for us, but there is that. And then we've also worked with a group uh, during our breaks uh, when we can, uh, like, like at the end of, um, well, end of summer, I mean, or beginning of summer, that we had a lot of donations, especially like milk, those kinds of things that got picked up. Uh, we'll do that right before uh, the uh, winter break and spring break. And so anytime we're gonna have extended break where product isn't gonna hold, we have, we've been able to build some relationships where they'll come and pick it up for us. Great. So, so we're getting it. better. No, no, I it, it, that, it, yeah, usually it's it been the barriers put in front of you, to be quite frank. I don't think it's the will, it's the barriers. Yeah, and Health Department, uh, King County Health Department has some specific regulations, and the group that's doing the share tables has actually got some exception. They've been able to achieve an exception on that. So we support them however we can, uh, just know we, we can't bring it back into our, our kitchen. It, it would be great if uh, uh, somehow you could part, I don't know how much you partner with party, uh, pantry packs. But if uh, any of the uh, non-perishables uh, could be uh, given on a Friday to the pantry packs folks, that would be a great boon to those folks. Yeah, the pantry pack people are involved with uh, the group that we're working with, with the shared yeah. tables, so okay. they are. And um, that's when I got here, uh, going on four years ago now, it was really, we, we had a lot of, from Sodexo, we had a lot of different areas that we supported donation-wise. And it was really my mission is that I want everything that we, do from a company wise, I wanted to stay in Lake Washington. And that's where I, I really partnered with Pantry Pack. And so that's only ones that we work with on, on um, that kind of uh, community involvement because we know it stays in the community. It really helps kids of uh, Lake Washington School District. I tell you, so, for four support. years that we've been working with you, you've been great. And, uh, uh, and the rest of the folks I've met from Sodexo, they really have a mission in mind as opposed to what I recall in high school, the mystery meet. And they still haven't figured out what some of those things were. But uh, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Now, like I said earlier, it's, it's a great district to be part of. It's just a, it's, every day is a new challenge. And, and as we grow and we, we you know, as, as building classrooms are, are pushed, we're, we're pushed to capacity too. So always trying to find ways that we can get out and meet the, the needs of the students. All right, seeing no other questions, I want to say thank you very much for thank the you. time and providing us this information. It was fabulous to see the great things happening. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, our next step is the legislative updates. I'm going to pass that to you, Director La Liberty. Well, we just had a work session today where the board discussed its legislative platform for the upcoming year. We will be bringing that back at our November, first November meeting. Uh, to discuss and adopt during the legislative update. I can't remember if we've had a board meeting since the, legis the was the Legislative Assembly, I think. Or maybe I just reported, I, have no, I don't think so. So uh, Siri and I both attended the WASDA, uh, Washington State School Directors Association Legislative Assembly in Spokane two, week two weeks ago. Uh, it was a wonderful time. There were over 100 districts represented. Um, and all of our priorities that we brought to the assembly were adopted as part of WASDA's platform. Uh, WASDA will be publishing its ranked priorities soon. I hope and anticipate that many of our priorities will be WASDA's priorities. But notwithstanding that, we have our platform that we will be adopting at our next meeting. Or no, sorry, in our November meeting. All right, any other questions for Director of Liberty? No, nope. all right, so next one, is there any board follow-up? Any future agenda items that we need to be considering? Any debriefing? I'll toss out the board member comment. Oh, he got one, board member comments, go. Well, it, 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 sorry, this is where I like to just compress them all into one question, but uh, the sample on the new homeschool model I found very useful in the sense of the short video is a wonderful dual purpose. I enjoyed that. I'm sure that it would be useful. It can be reused in other contexts. That's wonderful. Um, I did, and I wanted to make sure our teachers had gone home by now. On the, yeah, I know we're televised, but it's, it's 
But I'm not dissing the, 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 the teachers. I just always feel badly for teachers who are here for our meeting when I know that less than 12 hours they're going to be in the classroom. And it's something that the, the, the what we're being given, I love the achievement focus. Um, I do have, I, I don't need to see the faces of the school beyond the principal. It doesn't, it, it, it makes it longer by splitting up the presentation. It, it balkanizes it and, you know, some of them are clearly uncomfortable. The principle is enough for me, is all I wanted to debrief. I, I will take that into advisement. That is a school choice and they are very proud to be in front of our board to share their work as well. So yes, I don't want to tell they them they do can't enjoy come, it. but it's, <laughs> my feedback is actually Nobody will be to forced to be part of the host school presentation. The, the PTSA um, does their reflections every year and when they come to present their things, I enthusiastically encourage them to focus on the haikus and not the three page prose papers for the presentation. So anyway, I appreciated the brevity tonight and it was worth my time, so thank you. Any other comments on the host school to further that? Okay, so that's that's good. If there's any others, feel free. You can email those. One quick thing I'd just like to add on to ER2 for the ends results that we just had. If something comes to mind in the next week that you're like, oh, that was something I hadn't thought about and meant to say it, go ahead and email it to me so that we can keep that included as well. Because um, one of the things that I came up to the whole biliteracy, seal of biliteracy, the reason we do the seal of biliteracy, because that was the indicator, because one of our areas is that you will learn a language other than English. And the only thing we had at the time was the seal of biliteracy. And so that was really one step of what we were hoping then. So the piece I neglected as we were talking was, we've done some very good there in getting for our native speakers, but the gap that was stated was our native speakers are getting the seal of biliteracy, but if they look from race, it was white, that was not. So your native English speakers most likely are the ones not having that access. So that's something that I would challenge us to think about of how we start to bring that language down further into our middle schools and our elementary schools so that all students have that opportunity because of the value of learning another language for all. Um, so that was, so if something like that comes to mind to you later, please feel free to write it so we can make sure to incorporate all that in. Speaking of which, you came to me a little earlier than later. Um, as we looked at whether or not we've accomplished the ER2, I have a concern that because we do have some areas that are really struggling, I would encourage us to, to not gloss over that fact that we have those areas that are struggling and saying we've accomplished ER2. And to me, it's accomplished it for this group we're not accomplishing for that group and to perhaps we need to even think about talking about a split report almost i hate to say that but it, the idea that by splitting it up and saying look this group no problems here but let's see what in the world we're doing that we can do better at or look for a new option that's not currently being looked at uh, in the district because again it's the idea of a whole lot of effort going into it but for some of those kids, there's no output or so accomplishment. What I would like to recommend is when the, the draft comes of what we've discussed, because that's the part of what our role is this evening, and part of that assertion in the summary is we can then speak to where there are those exceptions and those areas to focus. And then our goal is to prioritize what those might be, because there might be many of them, and really our thought is to be able to put forward what do we see as where that needs to be. So I would encourage you to read that draft and put forth the language that you're speaking to um, in regards if there are specific things, but it is a priority thing and it is something the whole board is to agree on. So that's how I would recommend we go forward with that. Go ahead. I would just like to say, as I look at these reports for the first time as they're coming up and kind of getting a feel for what it is the board has requested, the other um, lens that I've uh, had some just initial conversations and want to understand more is, a growth model versus a proficiency model. And I know Tim has been building a lot of different things into our data capabilities to look at that, but I would encourage you to read the report carefully because some of the things that we did not um, put into this format just to keep it consistent, there's some really good stories that we're not telling as well, like some all-time high scores for some of our um, 
uh, disaggregated areas that I think we do need to highlight a little bit differently, but I think that's a, a different conversation, but I think that growth model also has a place in some of our discussions in terms of how we look at progress and what that means for data sets. All right, so I can include that in the draft that I send in regards to the growth, so we'll add that component in. Um, any other questions on that? All right, then I think at that point, our next board meeting will be held on October 15th. We have a study session at 5 p.m. The topic will be safety and security um, running in the school, the room of Sammamish, and at 7 p.m. we'll have our board meeting located here in the boardroom. So with that, I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty that we adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Yeah. Motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>